Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Rochelle Akufo. We've got some breaking inflation data out this morning as CPI for the month of January has just dropped. It came in at three tenths of a percent month over month. That year over year number coming in a little bit hotter than expected. That came in at 3.1 percent versus the 2.9 percent that was anticipated here. Looking a little bit further into the report here as well, CPI take out food and energy month over month. You actually saw that come in at four tenths of a percent of an increase there. And then on the year over year figure, you saw that come in at 3.9%. So here we're taking a look, quick look at the futures to see where that reaction is kind of playing out right now. You're down across the board for the Dow, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq futures with about an hour until the start of trade here on the day. But again, this signals a, a hotter read on inflation than anticipated. A larger question of what this trickle through to the Fed conversation will look like as well. It's true because, you know, we know that the Fed has been looking for this consistency in seeing inflation decline, especially when it comes to core PCE as well. And so it does give them a little bit more breathing room, though, a lot of concern about how much how much the Fed is doing at the moment. It is a policy too tight at the moment, too restrictive. And you figure after six months, you know, seven months of, of this data, the Fed's still not convinced at this point, still don't have um, inflation under control here. You have to wonder then some of the factors outside of the Fed's control con uh, contributing to these numbers. Yeah, it's really interesting. As I'm digging further into this report, one of the huge things to point out, food index. Food index increased by about four-tenths of a percent in January as the food at home index increased four-tenths of a percent. And the food away from home, all of those who are going out, having a little bevy with your friends, perhaps watching any type of the sporting matches that are taking place over that month of January. Anyway, you were paying uh, about half a percent more month over month here. But in contrast here, the energy index here, energy fell by about nine tenths of a percent over the month. They say that's due in large parts of the decline in the gasoline index here. So all these things considered, the shelter index, that continued to rise in January, increasing six tenths of a percent, contributing over two thirds of the monthly all items increase that we saw in this report as well. And we know we always keep an eye on what's happening with housing makes up the largest portion of the CPI data. We know that continues to be uh, a bone of contention here. People obviously wanting to see some of these prices uh, moderating here. And something else that we're going to be looking at um, later on uh, coming up this hour with some of our uh, reporters, really digging into some of the nuances here, because if inflation still isn't tamed at this point, you're seeing some of the market reaction uh, at the moment in the extended, extended trading at the moment. But it's clearly not getting what they wanted to hear. If the Fed has a little bit more room, and especially as we continue to look at wage pressure, saying that, look, the economy still has more room to run despite uh, the Fed's holding policy right now. Yeah, I think back to one of the comments from BlackRock's Rick Reeder coming into this report uh, and discussing inflation. He had said at the time that the Fed rightly is unwilling to declare victory yet here. Committee must be pleased by the progress that's been made. I mean, we were expecting a two-handle on this yeah. report. We got just a smidge above that. But ultimately here, he also went on to say, in fact, the core good CPI on both the three- and six-month annualized basis appears a great deal more normal and is in line with the average for the measure from 2014 to 2019. So that a little historical context to pair with these figures that we just got out this morning. Indeed. Well, for even more context on this, we're joined by Stephanie Roth, Wolf Research Chief Economist, and Claudia Sam, Sam Consulting Founder and former Federal Reserve Board Economist. A big welcome to you both here. So, Claudia, I want to start with you in terms of expectations. We weren't expecting any sort of big changes from the Fed off of just one report. Does this sort of add any credence to the fact that they can still afford to hold steady at, at this time and really push the rate cuts a little bit further out? Well, really. Whether or not it's a good policy, um, Fed Chair Jay Powell has told us March is off the table, right? So they want nine months of good data. This one report is not going to necessarily push them off. And frankly, this is going to look a lot better in the personal consumption expenditure index, which is their target. So it puts a lot less weight on uh, the shelter. And we saw medical care was a contributor. And a lot of that actually comes from the producer price index. So we're going to continue to see a wedge between CPI and PCE. And the feds told us they want a lot more data, you know, so they're going to wait. They got some data today. They got some things to think about. <laughs> Indeed. Stephanie, I want to bring you in here as well. I mean, you think about this data dependent fed and at what point they would need to see a, a significant shift or at least a long enough trend, perhaps, in order to shift their own pathway as well. What, what would you be watching for and what does this data do for that broader trend? Well, I think it's important to note that January print has had seasonality issues. So 
it is possible that we'll see a, a, a notable deceleration in February and March months. That's actually what we were calling for. We are expecting uh, the, the seasonality to add about a tenth to the print, and, and it seems like that might be the case. Services in particular, you tend to get annual uh, price increases that tend to go into effect in the month of January, and the seasonals just don't appear to be picking that up yet. We've seen this for the past couple of years that January tends to be a bit hotter than what's the underlying trend. So our base case is certainly, you know, marches off the, off the ta table, like Claudia said. Uh, our base case is that they're going to be cutting in, in June. They want to see a little bit more data. They want to see the year-over-year -year, uh, CPI print come down closer to 2%, which will we'll need another couple of months in order to get there. And Claudia, I know that the, obviously the Fed hyper-focused on that 2% uh, inflation data, but obviously a lot of this, this is lagging data. So when you look at the strength of the labor market, when you combine that in, how much credence does that give to the cost to the economy of doing too much versus too little right now? Well, I mean, the Fed is really rolling the dice on the U.S. labor market. And they're leaning on it saying, hey, we have the luxury of time. The labor market is strong. And yet that doesn't necessarily have to go forward. And we saw in 2023 a strong labor market, a strong GDP growth, and lots of disinflation. So this idea that the two are linked together and there's a trade-off, at this point, we ought to be really putting a lot less weight on that. And, you know, they have a dual mandate, getting inflation low and also keeping unemployment low. And, you know, both sides of the mandate, they matter. And so with that in mind, does it, does it feel like, because we've continued to hear that, Claudia, higher for longer is what investors should be getting used to, what the markets should start to price in. But there's a lot of over-exuberance, as, as Steve Bakliuka was telling us yesterday. And so ultimately, do you believe that higher for longer is, is something that the Fed is doing a good job of, of actively communicating and that the markets actually get it? Well, sometimes we don't hear what we don't want to hear, right? <laughs> I th and I think the Fed, you know, has multiple times Jay Powell has gone out and really beat it into people's heads, no march. And finally, the markets listen. Now, I'll say the Fed is data-driven. I mean, I think they're more backward-looking than they should be because monetary policy works forward with lags. And yet, the Fed will respond to reality, right? So they will take on board if the disinflation comes faster than they think. They also said, we're not going to wait until 2% to do our first cut. So they're going to have to get going at some point this year. But it's really all about the inflation data. At least that's what the Fed has put emphasis on. And Stephanie, what are you watching in terms of the stickier parts of the inflation picture and how much of that you think you know, the, the markets are, are pricing in and sort of the domino effect for the economy? Yeah, I mean, service is, is for sure the, the stickier parts, and that's what's linked to the labor market. But we've seen wage inflation come down. We expect that to continue to be the case, and that should have its effect on, on services prices just with a lag. So we should start to see that the services components continue to slow down. Um, we very much expect shelter prices to, to slow down from here. Uh, I think some of this was seasonal noise in the January print. But you're seeing real-time measures of rent coming quite soft. You have a lot of multifamily supply coming back online. So, so that part of the, the services basket should very much continue to decelerate this year. And then it's just a matter of the, the, the wage data continuing to soften, which will, will filter its way into services. And, and how actively, Stephanie, do we expect that wage data to continue to soften? Um, I mean, now I would say the, the, the trend in wage inflation is roughly 4%. I think we'll get down closer to that 3.5% towards the, the, the middle to end part of this year, which... You know, if, if we continue to see another ECI print that's similar to what we saw in Q4, the Fed should feel a lot more comfortable about where wage inflation is today. The, the, the ECI print was actually very close to, to in line with the, the wage print that's, that's consistent with the Fed's 2% mandate. They're looking for wage inflation somewhere around 3.5%. And, and so far, the, the, at least the most recent data has been consistent with that. Average hourly earnings are, are quite a bit more noisy, uh, and, and I would put a lot more weight on the ECI. So, Claudia, then, as you're looking at the potential for the worst outcome here for the Fed, staying too restrictive until something breaks versus inflation, the risk of inflation reaccelerating, um, what do you think is the bigger risk? And really, how should the Fed modeling be adapted to the realities of what we're seeing in the lagged data versus the actual data? So the Fed sees the biggest risk as the reseller, um, inflation coming back up, even if it doesn't come up that much because they have said, multiple Federal Reserve officials, what they see as the worst outcome is the Fed starts cutting gradually, and then they have to raise interest rates because the inflation picks up. Personally, I think the worst possible outcome is they go until they break something, whether it's something in financial markets or in the labor market, 
Because frankly, the Fed, there's been many cases of them doing quote unquote adjustments where they have to kind of switch direction. So, but they have made clear that that they do not want to cut and then have to raise. So they're really afraid of that inflation kind of popping back up. You know, Claudia, as I'm, as I'm looking through some of the other items within this reading, it, it seems that services are still largely running hot here. How, how long do we expect that to be the case here versus goods and the spending there that a, a lot of people have perhaps gotten a little bit more value conscious about or tried to have some value hacks that they implement? I think we have to remember there's pieces in there that are contracts that aren't really tied to the current wage growth. Shelter is one that we've talked a lot about because it takes time for those rents to come through. Another one that keeps getting cited is the motor vehicle insurance. Mm -hmm. Again, that is one that takes time to work its way through. It had to see the auto prices come down. So you've got some of these things that are put in the sticky part of inflation really aren't about the wages and it's just gonna just take time to work those contracts out. Now I don't want to like, you know, dismiss what we're seeing in services all over, but there is a part of it that we just gotta stop thinking, oh, all of this uh, services is somehow tied to the labor market. And, and Stephanie, do you see that same dynamic as well? We're watching the the ten year uh, retreating here after after that CPI data coming out. A lot of people, you know, looking at some of these these stickier aspects of housing and especially rents. Yeah, I mean, well, if you look at the the print that we just saw, the the measure of rent actually decelerated a bit, but owners equivalent rent picked up. Um, I, this this is a, a piece of the the inflation basket that I feel really good about continuing to slow down. As Claudia mentioned, it's really really lagged. So we don't have a we don't have a sense, at least in the in the terms of how the data are reported, that's not based on what's happening real time. So through through the throughout the course of this year, we should very much see owners equivalent rent and rent continue to slide down. But it, it does make sense that the the market is not looking at this report favorably, in part because you know the the, the Fed is so dependent on each each CPI print. Um, and it's hard to decipher what is seasonal effects and what's actually happening on the ground. Our base case is that in the next couple of months, the, the inflation data should look a lot cooler than what, where it is today. Claudia, we know the Fed typically has some sensitivity around cutting during a, a general election cycle. Uh, are we at the point where that could be the reality that we're headed towards? The Fed wanting to seem apolitical, but still at the same time needing to implement potential cuts later on this year, while there is, of course, the campaigning that is taking place and all the way up and through November. It's going to be a painful year for the Fed. I mean, they're already getting it on all sides that, you know, if they cut, if they don't cut in terms of what it's going to do to the economy, the Fed is used to always getting blamed for whatever happens. This year's just going to be more intense. It is not a partisan institution. They are not going to put a thumb on the scale for either candidate. And it should not get in the way of when they cut or when they don't cut. But again, you're not going to be able to tell, right? They're going to be making decisions in an election year and people are going to point fingers at them. And yet knowing the institution, knowing the Fed chair, Jay Powell, they're just going to, you know, put their heads down and do their job. Indeed. And so, Stephanie, what are you watching in terms of the potential upsides for the Fed, perhaps outside of what the Fed is in control of, that could also contribute to what's going to be happening with inflation in the coming quarter? One big thing is this potential tax deal that might happen this year. Um, the, the House already passed it. It's very possible that the Senate will, will do that, too. And that can be a, a pretty big stimulus for the economy this year. We're looking at about $136 billion of, of gross stimulus added to the economy, which could, in, in our estimates, could boost GDP by about 0.3 percent. So if that actually comes in, in, into fruition, that could just be another upside su surprise for, for growth this year. But as we, as we did see last year, you, you, you can see fairly strong GDP growth with inflation continuing to come back down, which is our base case. Um, but there, there definitely appears to be more upside risk to the economy uh, than downside the way we see it. We'll certainly continue to track that. Appreciate you both for joining us. Stephanie Roth, Wolf Research Chief Economist, and Claudia Sam, Sam Consulting Founder and former Federal Reserve Board Economist. Appreciate you taking the time today. All right, all your markets action just ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
It's been one month since the SEC's approval of spot Bitcoin ETFs. Since launching, funds have pulled in nearly $3 billion in inflows, it's according to coin shares. Today, Bitcoin prices briefly topped $50,000, boosted in part by spot Bitcoin ETF inflows. Joining us now for the latest pulse on all things crypto is Dante Cook, Swan Bitcoin head of Swan Business, along with Sean Farrell, Fundstrat Global Advisors head of Digital Asset Strategy. Guys, welcome both of you to the program. And Sean, maybe I'll start with you. You know, it, it has been, Sean, about a month since the SEC did approve these new spot Bitcoin ETFs. What have we, what have we learned so far, Sean? Granted, early days, but what have we learned so far about demand for these new products? <clears throat> Well, um, you know, we have learned that, um, you know, bringing BlackRock into the equation is significant. We've learned that there is demand uh, for these products. Um, and we've also learned that people, you know, generally like low cost uh, liquid products over, you know, other products that might be more expensive and not, uh, you know, track the underlying asset as effectively. Um, Dante, is this indeed the reason that we have seen Bitcoin rallying like it has been, or are there other factors going on that people should know about? Well, there are a lot of other factors um, outside of just the ETF inflows, although that is a massive reason why uh, you're, you're seeing a lot of this price action, you know, because these ETF uh, launches have been historic, right? There have been over 5,000 ETFs launched over the last 30 years. And FBTC, Fidelity's product, iBit, BlackShare's product are number one and number two of the most successful ETF launches of all time. And so, you know, just like the Chiefs uh, and Patrick Mahomes won back to back championships, I mean, these last two weeks, you've seen back to back historic levels of inflows um, and dollars moving into this asset class. And when you attach that to things like the Bitcoin halving, where the supply of overall Bitcoin will get cut in half uh, right around April. I mean, you're seeing a massive inflow of demand, um, institutional and retail, uh, hitting a, a, a supply shock. So I think there's a lot of different factors there. And Sean, I'm curious, um, you know, Bitcoin jumping to 50,000, first time in more than two years, Sean. Where do you think the price heads from here, at least in the kind of near to intermediate term? What are the puts and takes we need to consider? Yeah, look, so we, we start our, you know, our, our analysis is based, uh, you know, we always start with macro, right? And um, we saw some potential turbulence heading into the year, you know, thought we were heading higher. Our price target for the year was 125, uh, certainly not in a straight line. But uh, a lot of that turbulence, uh, in our view, was going to stem from a repricing of the timing uh, and frequency of any potential Fed rate cuts, um, as well as potential upper pressure on the long end of the curve due to um, any potential increased coupon issuance from the Treasury. Um, and if we look at what has happened over the past several weeks, uh, you know, from right before the ETF launch up through today, uh, you know, we've kind of withstood a pretty uh, constant barrage of negative macro variables, right? We've had a pretty uh, massive rally in the dollar uh, you know, we've priced out most of the excessive rate cuts that I just mentioned, that I just alluded to. Um, and we also had some movement, upwards movement uh, at the long end of the curve. And so all that considered, you know, it's, it's pretty, it, it paints a pretty constructive picture that, you know, having just gone through that, being at 50,000, uh, you know, that gives me some confidence that this rally, you know, in the near term certainly has some room to run. And Dante, that said, you know, we've seen that happen with other risk assets too, right? In other words, stocks have also been rallying in the in the face of some um, challenges here. And so I'm curious going forward, what are the biggest risks that you see to the continued rally in Bitcoin and, and crypto more broadly? Well, I think the big risks, I mean, like Sean mentioned, are, are really macro things. But when you take a step back and you look at Bitcoin in general, I mean, it has commodity properties in that it has a finite supply. Um, it's it's not controlled by any one party, uh, yet it has this high beta aspect to it that it rallies when you have liquidity enter the market. And so one of the things that we look at pretty closely and that Bitcoin's price closely tracks is global M2 liquidity, like into the market. And so if we have, you know, the Fed, which Jerome Powell on 60 Minutes uh, uh, last Sunday mentioned that they were going to have rate cuts this past year, um, and you talk about those things like Bitcoin is the fastest race in uh, the fastest horse in that race. And so if we have, you know, pretty quick and pretty severe 
you know, Fed rate cuts, interest rates go lower, we should expect to see Bitcoin's price go higher. But I mean, the macro ma the macro backdrop, I mean, when you're when you step back and you look at things, you got mortgage delinquencies, uh, you know, skyrocketing, you have auto delinquencies skyrocketing, you have credit card debt reaching over a trillion, you have government fiscal debt reaching over a trillion in terms of interest payments, you have unemployment numbers, you know, quote unquote, being strong. But when you actually look at the data, you have a lot of uh, uh, jobless claims, you have a lot of part time workers, not really full time workers and jobs. And then the jobs that you do have are a lot of government workers related to snowstorms and things like that. And so when you look at the backdrop of the economy, right, things are not overall as strong as maybe the picture that's being painted. So Bitcoin, like other assets, like we're beholden to a macro market and environment. But as Bitcoin is beginning to show, especially with these ETF flows, like you're starting to see an element where Bitcoin decouples from other risk on assets because it's an entirely different asset class unto itself. Guys, thanks so much. Appreciate your perspective on this. Dante and Sean, appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. Well, fears around the health of the regional banking sector are being reignited again after New York Community Bank Corp's recent earnings report pointed to losses in its commercial real estate portfolio. Those struggles have put the commercial real estate market back under the spotlight. Research from Apollo Global Management, the parent company of Yahoo Finance, shows that small banks account for 70 percent of all outstanding commercial real estate loans. Trouble in the market potentially could mean trouble for more of these smaller lenders. Joining me now is Stan Van Neuerberg. He's Columbia Business School Professor of Real Estate. Professor, it's good to talk to you today. I want to start specifically on the issue of New York Community Bank Corp, because I think investors have been trying to figure out, you know, how much of what we saw reflected in their balance sheet is specific to NYCB. How much of this is about a broader collapse, if you will, that's likely to come. I mean, you've been modeling out some of these scenarios. How do you view this? Well, Akiko, I think that there's a broader commercial real estate issue that we're facing here, right? Most notably in the office market, where, you know, vacancy rates have been rising, rents have, you know, have been uh, falling, and, and and loans have been coming to, uh, to a head and failing to refinance over the past year. You know, New York Community Bank has a lot more multifamily exposure than office exposure, but even there in the multifamily market, we're seeing weakness. Um, let's start by talking more about the office space, um, because I know you've kind of been modeling out the impact from remote work. At, at the end of the day, it, this is about just the change in the way, the way we work. We don't necessarily go into offices anymore. If you've walked around New York City, you see how empty some of these office spaces are. What does that ultimately mean in terms of the decline of the value of some of these spaces? Right. So my research have, has sort of quantified that, you know, the decline in, uh, in in office demands, you know, due to the combination of remote work, but also higher interest rates, ultimately results in a loss of value of around 50 percent for for commercial property, for office buildings, right? which is which is a dramatic decline. And in many cases would wipe out the equity in some of these underlying uh, underlying buildings. And when, when are we likely to see that? I mean, the, the concern is, of course, when those loans come due, um, the payment just isn't going to be there because of that decline in value. I mean, you sort of mentioned that, look, when you think about where tenants are right now, they are in the process of sort of figuring out what that next step should be uh, when they have to renew the leases. At, at what point does this all sort of become kind of an avalanche? Right. So, I mean, office leases are long term in nature. Right. So even today, there's still a lot of tenants that are serving out their pre pandemic leases. But over the last four years, a lot of tenants have already reduced their office demand. And in a recent survey by CBRE, something like 40 percent of companies are indicating that they want to cut their office demand even more by a further, you know, 30 percent or more in the next three years. Right. So this is sort of a three and reckon slow motion as these leases are coming up for renewal. A lot of tenants are deciding not to renew them. That causes cash flow issues for the landlords in these buildings. And eventually, when that mortgage comes due, they may not be able to refinance that mortgage. Who's most exposed right now in that scenario? Right. So about, you know, there's about six trillion dollars of commercial real estate debt outstanding. Banks own about half of it. And we know that smaller regional banks own like 70 percent of all that bank 
commercial real estate exposure. So that's sort of a, a natural place to look at smaller regional size banks like New York Community Bank, but, but also other banks like Valley Bank, for example. You mentioned multifamily units, um, certainly a, a, a sort of the next concern that investors are watching. What does that scenario look like right now? Right. So multifamily is a little different because, of course, it's not related to remote work. But, you know, like uh, the office market, you know, it has also experienced this, you know, sharp rise in interest rates over the last two years. And then we need to remember that multifamily was really red hot in 2021 and 2022 with something like six hundred and fifty billion dollars of total sales of apartment buildings at record prices. So, you know, there was a lot of froth in the apartment market. You know, a lot of those valuations were premised on ever increasing rental growth. And that rent growth has now basically stopped or at the very least slowed down. So a lot of those valuations now look frothy in the new environment with lower rent growth and with higher interest rates. And again, when those loans uh, you know, that finance these properties come up for renewal, uh, many of them will, will, will have difficulty refinancing. What does that ultimately mean for the landscape of, of major cities in the US? Obviously, New York City, a big focus, San Francisco, another one that gets named a lot. Um, the, the use cases changing, obviously the, the tenants starting to move out. You're talking about some of these, you know, multifamily units also um, that changes as well. I mean, what these build, buildings that are currently standing, what ultimately becomes of them? Look, I mean, I think there's sort of a, a tale of two stories here, right? So New York City still has a lot of shortage of housing, like many cities do. Uh, you know, if apartment rents come down a little bit, that would be good news for renters. Um, you know, the office building landscape is different. We have too much office. Uh, and because of those secular changes in remote work, you know, we probably need to convert a good chunk of that office space. Right. And that's what the conversation has been about in, in places like San Francisco and New York. Uh, but in many cities, right, we have we need to get uh, we need to repurpose some of that existing uh, office stock into something else. Housing being just one example. It is 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Rochelle Kufo. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. We're tracking early session volume and bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. That's right. We've got a packed show for you on this Tuesday morning. Futures sliding. Dow and Nasdaq futures off more than 300 points each. The S&P 500 futures down more than 1% on the first consumer inflation print report of the year. January CPI coming in hotter than expected. That's right. And investors are digesting the latest round of earnings and what they could mean for the market's momentum. Coca-Cola, Hasbro, Marriott, and Shopify. All trending tickers on Yahoo Finance's homepage this morning. So let's get right to it with the three things that you need to know. Your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal, Jared Blickery, and, well, actually, Madison Mills as well, standing by. We've got more. Hey, Brad, that's right. The latest read on inflation coming in hotter than expected this morning. Consumer prices in January rising three-tenths of a percent over the last month and 3.1 percent over the last year. Excluding the volatile categories like food and energy, prices jumped 3.9 percent over last year. And Coca-Cola shares edging higher following quarterly results. The food and beverage giant reporting profits in line with streets estimates, while revenue saw a boost driven by companies' ongoing price hikes. Coke expects revenue growth to likely moderate this year, but shares are moving slightly higher as the company expects full-year organic revenue will grow 6 to 7 percent this year, down from last year's 12 percent growth. And activist investor Carl Icahn announcing in a Securities and Exchange Commission disclosure a nearly 10 percent stake in JetBlue. In the filing mentioning he thinks the company is undervalued. There's also potential discussion hinted at there about a board seat to come. His nearly 10 percent stake equating it to over 30 million shares.
Well, good morning, everyone. We are less than 30 minutes away from the opening bell on Wall Street. Futures sliding as investors digest January's CPI report. Inflation coming in hotter than the street expected. Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal joins us at the desk with more. We're watching the futures reaction here this morning. Ali, help us break down some of these numbers. Yeah, I mean, economists expected this would be the first report since March 2021 that we would finally get headline annual inflation below 3%. That just did not happen. Inflation coming in hotter than expected. 3.1% over the prior year in January and also higher on a month-over-month -month basis there. Um, now, if you dig in closer to this report, there are a few uh, notable call-outs. One is the shelter index. That rose 6% on an unadjusted annual basis. Sticky shelter inflation has what has kept core inflation particularly high, and that's leading to the Federal Reserve to be a bit more cautious when it comes to rate hikes down the line, I, I, I'm, excuse me, rate cuts down the line, which markets definitely want. You can see that reflected in the major indices. They are uh, lower today on the heels of this inflation print. And it looks like markets are now pricing in a June cut, completely erasing those expectations for a cut to come in May. So, you know, when we get these higher than expected reports and we get hotter inflation, that just bolsters the Federal Reserve's monetary policy to keep rates where they are for now, which investors obviously don't want to see at the current moment. Indeed, the Fed continuing to say haven't beaten inflation yet, and at least this, uh, this latest print adding to that. Now, we've got team coverage to break down today's inflation data with Yahoo Finance's Danny Romero, Brooke De Palma, and Praz Subramanian. So, Danny, let's start with you. What did you see from Shelter? The shelter component of CPI did not disappoint. On a yearly basis, shelter came in at 6%. This was expected by some economists as there continues to be really strong rental demand. Now, on a monthly ba basis, shelter ha uh, gained 0.6%. Remember, the shelter index makes up about a third of the CPI basket. And there are two components that really hold the biggest weight in the shelter index, and that's owner's equivalent rent which is OER, the hypothetical rent that you would earn if you rent out your property. And then rent, which really lags real-time rent data. So OER continued to stay in the range of 0.4% to 0.6% per month since last March. And on last month, OER rose 0.6% on a monthly month basis. Now, while rent prices logged in another 0.4% gain, what does this all mean? This is reassurance that rents are coming down as expected, not resulting in more price pressures and really not to worry so far so now, but, but there still remains to be really strong uh, rent demand. Now we're going to have to turn to Brooke De Palma that will give us the breakdown on food prices. Brooke, what are you seeing? Good morning, Danny. Thanks so much. The cost of food here continues to outpace of restaurants and bars is rising faster than the cost of groceries. And that's what I'm watching in particular. Food, uh, the cost of food to dine out is up roughly 5.1%. That's whereas the cost of groceries is up just 1.2%. And this widening gap is something that I continue to watch. But important to note here that the cost of groceries did see a slight uptick due to some sticky inflation that we're seeing. Frozen non-carbonated juices and drinks spiked 29.9% year over year. That's in, due to price hikes taken by major companies. In addition to that cost of ongoing sticky inflation among sugar prices, sugar and sugar substitutes, those jumped 7.2 percent year over year, and that's largely due to the El Nino weather and pattern that we're seeing that's negatively impacting sugar crop production. That's something economists continue to see throughout the beginning of 2024, and they expect to continue throughout this year. We're also seeing beef and veal, that lower cattle supply, really increasing costs there, up 7.7 percent year over year. But once again, cost of food at restaurants, the cost of dine out is rising faster than the cost of groceries, and that we're already seeing that impact, and that's largely due to the fact that when this sort of uh, uptick happens, you'll see consumers pull back a bit. They'll cook more at home, and this is particularly impacting the lower income consumer. We already heard shout outs on recent earnings calls. McDonald's CEO calling in a battleground for low income consumers. They did note that they're seeing some transaction size reduction and some trade down among this particular demographic. And Starbucks, they don't really have, uh, they have a higher income demographic typically, but they did note that that occasional customer is pulling back, and that's largely because it costs more to dine out. So consumers are saying, hey, I'll make that coffee at home. Prosy Marini, and I know you're weighing in on autos. What are you seeing there? 
Hey, Brooke, yeah, continued moderation, even deflation in parts of the auto market. In January, new vehicle prices were flat for the month and only up 7 tenths of 1% year over year. In the used market, prices were down 3.4% and down 3.5% year over year. This continues the trend we saw in December and the back half of 2023, where prices were moderating and returning back to normal. Now, January is typically a slow month for auto sales, so a bigger test for inflation in the auto sector will be during the spring buying season in the months ahead. Brad, back to, you, back to you. All right, thanks so much, Pross. Uh, much to really break down and continue to monitor how the futures are looking at this. Of course, some slippage across the board for the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500. We want to shift gears here for a hot second as the JetBlue shares, we're tracking those here pre-market. They are soaring after billionaire activist investor Carl Icahn disclosed he has an almost 10% stake in the airline, calling the stock undervalued and attractive. We have our very own Madison Mills live from the New York Stock Exchange with more on this. Hey, Maddie. Hey, Brad. So a great day, too, for JetBlue's newest CEO taking over on Monday and seeing this amazing surge in the pre-market trade, a little over 15 percent at the peak here. Following this SEC disclosure from Carl Icahn, like you mentioned, announcing that he has taken a nearly 10 percent stake in the company, that equates to about $200 million and over 33 million shares. So it's interesting for me. I wanted to take a look at JetBlue. Blue stock year to date because he's been kind of amping up his stake in the company throughout January and February. And you can see a couple of times random bumps up in the stock when the airline industry as a whole has been really struggling year to date here, right? We've had everything going on with Boeing. And on top of that, JetBlue struggling with the Spirit merger as well. So seeing some of those uh, moves up in the trade when it comes to JetBlue's stock price indicates to me that those might have been some of the days that we saw uh, Carl Icahn upping his stake in the company. Now, I also want to run through some of the other details that we got in this SEC filing. As you mentioned, a potential board seat on the table, continuing discussions about what that board involvement is going to look like. But the thing that I'm hearing about here at the Stock Exchange is this interest and this statement about JetBlue being undervalued. And that is a narrative that makes sense when you look at some of the other airline names. I was looking this morning at the year-to-date performance of an American Airlines, United, uh, really struggling year-to-date. Having said that, JetBlue also struggling. They're down about 28% over the past year. The question is whether or not this activist investor move is going to be able to push that stock higher and whether or not the street agrees that this name is undervalued. Well, we'll continue to watch, but certainly getting a strong reaction so far this morning. Appreciate you, as always, our very own Madison Mills. Well, a refreshing taste for investors this morning. Shares of Coca-Cola edging higher in pre-market trading. That's following the company's latest earnings results. The beverage giant sales topping estimates in its fourth quarter, driven by firm demand and higher prices. Let's deep dive into these earnings with our very own Brooke De Palma. Brooke, you're back with us. You spoke with Coca-Cola CFO John Murphy. What did he have to say? Good morning, Rochelle. That's right. I spoke to him this morning, and he largely weighed in on some key trends that we're seeing that give us key insight into the state of the consumer right now. Let's kick things off with what we're seeing here in North America. He said the consumer here remains resilient after it took much sharper pricing in 2023. He said that North America volume dropped as less people really bought water, sports drinks, coffee, and tea. But in addition to that, the overall basket continues to increase in pricing, and that that means that we're seeing that low lower income consumer, yet again, be a bit more value cost conscious. But he said that because of their broad portfolio, they're able to come up with more, much more pack configurations that really allows these lower income consumers or any consumer really here looking for value to have this sort of diversification, these different options that they could buy into. Now, number two here, he did say that moderation is very much so the name of the game in 2024. He said that after carrying over pricing that they took in 2023, they're expecting a much more normal environment here in the U.S. as far as price hikes go for this year. But he did note that they continue to see hyperinflation in countries like Argentina and Africa. But a general trend that they're seeing is this moderation in the cost of commodities. But a few key elements as far as agriculture commodities goes, well, we're still seeing some stickiness there. That means the price of sugar, the price of orange juice continues to edge higher globally. And one thing that he did note is those ongoing conflicts in the Middle East. He calls it a near term challenge. He noted that those conflicts did knock a point of a volume of our numbers in the fourth quarter. 
And he said that this continues to be something that they're going to watch continuing throughout 2024. So certainly lots of near-term headways, lots of challenges, but the North America consumer seems to be continue to put up with those higher prices. And while we have you, Brooke, on this, and, and excellent takeaways from that conversation, you know, I, I wonder where, in terms of the strength that they're seeing in their business, where that's also kind of trickling through to margins, that they have anything to say about that and where profit is holding up strong. Yeah, he said the profit is holding up strong. In addition to that, he really did say that because of the fact that they do have this broad portfolio, they're able to sort of play with the consumer about what they want and where exactly they're looking at. And on the street, they continue to be optimistic about this company. Many analysts that I've spoken to in the recent weeks, whether it be about the Super Bowl or largely about PepsiCo and Coca-Cola earnings, many analysts continue to like Coca-Cola over PepsiCo, in fact. But among PepsiCo and Cola, they continue to stand out as the main two on the street to look out for and watch in 2024 as consumers continue to seem to put up with this. And I'll continue to watch out. The call is underway, and I'll keep a close eye on that as well. Indeed. Appreciate you breaking that down for us. We will, of course, get more on Coca-Cola's earnings with Gerald Pascarelli coming up later on. Well, futures sliding on January's CPI report. Dow futures off 400 points. We'll continue to break down the report as the morning goes on. We're just about 15 minutes away from the opening bell on Wall Street, so stay tuned. Shares of Shopify under pressure this morning. They're down by about 12.5% as the company outlook 
fails to impress Wall Street here. The e-commerce giant reporting Q4 results that beat on the top and bottom line, but decelerating revenue outlook, weighing on shares a little bit here. And ultimately, you're taking a look at that beat that they did see on both the revenue and the EPS front. It really is, I think, what they're guiding for here going forward. And, and it's still not bad. It just shows some deceleration when they're talking about the revenue growth here. But notably, I think Pretty much line by line, this was a standout quarter from them. It's just a matter of the expectations that many investors may have built into the thesis here. It's true because it, it really builds into that some of that um, pattern that we've seen of some of these beats still not getting rewarded when you right. look at the, the share price and the reaction afterwards. When you look at gross merchandise volume, that increased 23% in Q4, so to $75 billion versus the $71.6 billion that was expected. So. Still seeing that growth there, but for some reason, the street not buying Shopify's story right now, especially when it comes to the profit outlook. I mean, they had profit of $657 million or 51 cents a share, compared with a loss of $623.7 million, million or 49 cents a share a year earlier. So they're having this turnaround story. They're you know, talking about building more innovation and AI into their systems. Mm. Now, I know there was some, some pushback from some merchants who were seeing the price of some of the fees attached to Shopify ticking up. But I'm not, not sure if the, the sell-off that we're seeing really justifies what we saw based on earnings here. Well, the shift still remains in their favor in terms of how consumers are finding inspiration and then that's correlating into a purchase decision. I think about the amount of, and this is purely anecdotal and personal, but the amount of purchases that I've made over the past year just from something that I've seen on Instagram or something that I've seen on Pinterest even. All of those places of inspiration, they're driving that next purchase decision as the mall becomes even more digitized and that next source of kind of a, a click to buy decision is really driven in these in-app experiences where Shopify already has that partnership positioning with many of the social media companies. It was a correct strategy on their front. It continues to pay out. The company's president, Harley Finkelstein, talking about the ever-evolving e-commerce landscape and delivering products that propel merchants' businesses forward. And where that shows up, the gross merchandise volume growth. That accelerated in Q4 and for all of 2023. Strong financial results here at the end of the day and year-over-year -year revenue growth of 24% that you mentioned, which actually represents 30% growth when adjusted for the sale of some of their logistics business too. It's true. When you think of the small businesses that were able to, to grow because of Shopify, Still waiting to see what, why the math isn't mathing, at least for, for investors. Yeah, there was an options AI move that had actually priced in about an 11% move here either way. So we're seeing that play out right now, just a little bit more than that. And speaking of moves, Bitcoin price is hovering near 50,000 after hitting the mark earlier in the trading week, a benchmark value the cryptocurrency hasn't sat at since late 2021. And it was interesting because a lot of people thought they were going to see this big swing on spot Bitcoin ETFs, which they did see you know, some excitement leading up to it. But then you also saw Bitcoin prices recently moving up in tandem with some of the concerns that came up with regional banks over the past uh, five to seven days as well. So I'm not sure this is so much of a, a spot Bitcoin ETF sort of fueled enthusiasm versus people sort of seeing Bitcoin as, as a good alternative if there is some uncertainty still to be worked out in some of these regional banks. I just tell you what, I mean, for the past year and the performance that we've seen with Bitcoin up 125% over the past 52 weeks, if you take that out to perhaps the beginning of 2023, you're far beyond that. Uh, and so ultimately, the larger question going forward from here, we're staring down the halving event. That's expected in April. You're also looking at technicals that look pretty strong right now off of the larger kind of trend that has seen some higher highs along the way in this broader trend line here. Um, and I think going forward, the bulls are going to continue to pile into Bitcoin right now. You can pretty much expect that, especially with any dip. Mm -hmm. uh, and that buy on the dip fervor, that certainly does extend into Bitcoin. The winter is well behind us. And so now Bitcoin summer, whatever that looks like, hot bit summer, hot Bitcoin summer, hot coin summer, whatever you're calling it. Once we get into June, it'll be interesting to see what this thing trades at. It's true. And as you mentioned, with more institutional investors at play, perhaps we won't see as much volatility as when we saw retail investors dominating that space. Well, earnings were the big driver for the market last week, and names like Airbnb are set to report this week. Here's a look back at how the company got here. Although it just went public in 2020, Airbnb has already built itself into the go-to choice for short and long-term homestays and experiences. Airbnb's gross profit in 2023 was nearly $8 billion, 
more than a 20% increase year over year. Let's take a look at what led to Airbnb's boom with Beyond the Ticker, where we dive into some of the company's biggest moments. In 2007, Brian Chesky and Joe Jebbia created the initial concept for Airbnb. One year later, the airbedandbreakfast.com website launched, renting out three air mattresses within their San Francisco loft. In 2009, the website shortened to airbnb.com and expanded from airbeds and shared spaces to a wide variety of properties. Later that year, Airbnb raised $585,000 from Sequoia Capital in a seed round valuing the company at $2.4 million. By 2011, Airbnb announced it hit 1 million bookings on its website and reached unicorn status. The privately owned startup was now valued at $1 billion. Airbnb completed a redesign of its site and mobile app in 2014, including the new Bello logo. Later that year, San Francisco voted no to a measure to restrict Airbnb rentals in the city. The company spent more than $8 million in its ad campaign in the lead up to the vote. Since 2016, Airbnb has expanded through several strategic launches and acquisitions, including Trip for Real, Airbnb Experiences, Luxury Retreats, Nido, Airbnb Plus, and Hotel Tonight. On December 10th, 2020, Airbnb went public via initial public offering at $68 a share, raising $3.5 billion. The company was valued at $47 billion. With plans to expand its AI services, Airbnb acquired GamePlanner.ai in 2023. Airbnb CEO and co-founder Brian Chesky said, Airbnb is one of the more humanistic companies in technology, and I believe that we can develop some of the best interfaces and practical applications for AI. Bank of America's February Global Fund Manager Survey is out, and the results are pointing to more bullish investor sentiment ahead. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer joins us at the desk with some of the takeaways. Where are we seeing the tide turning here? Yeah, Michelle, I mean, broadly, we're seeing the tide turning, right, as you sort of hinted at there. Overall, investors more bullish here, the most bullish they've been in about two years. But it's interesting when you take a look at the overall investment sentiment chart from Bank of America, investors are the most bullish they've been in two years, but when you look at that, 
broad span we see there, they aren't nearly as bullish as other periods where we where the market may have really gotten ahead of itself, which I think is sort of an interesting perspective thing. It's another form of sentiment. We talk a lot about this with consumer sentiment that hasn't really come all the way back since the pandemic. And people have just been so negative that, yes, we're seeing more bullish here. But when in comparison, it isn't quite actually that bullish. And I, I want to dig into a couple of the things here, guys, of why people are so bullish, right? One of those things is that recession call. We know a lot of Wall Street banks have been pulling their recession calls over the last couple months. Deutsche Bank was the latest one to do it last week. And then you take a look here for the first time since April 2022, we have investors saying that they don't expect a global recession. Interesting to highlight the word global there because we know the U.S. economy, a lot of people feel like is doing well. That is not necessarily the case of how people have felt broadly about say Europe or something like that. So I found that to be interesting. And a few other things to hit on here, guys, cash allocation, finally coming down. So is it clear as well where there's perhaps more of an outsized sentiment for even this bullish tenor that's prevailing right now within the markets? I know you guys know the answer because we looked at it before the show, but if you had to guess, you probably would have guessed tech, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and it is tech. Uh, it was very interesting, I guess, to see in some ways, like, of course, right, it, it makes sense, but investors very bullish on tech right now, the highest allocation since August 2020. Again, I like to compare this to different times, right, and think about where we are there. I thought it was interesting it was August 2020 instead of, say, 2021, right? We talk a lot about the quick bubble we saw in 2021 and different people buying in. So interesting to see investors really bullish on tech there. Curious to see if this starts to shift at all as we, of course, talk about the broadening of the market and if it's ever going to come every day. <laughs> Eventually, does this chart start to move a little bit? I think will be interesting. But for now... People still love tech. So did we get any more hints about how long the magnificent trade seven lasts before it either needs to broaden out, sort of lift all of the boats to where some of these estimates are looking? People are certainly all in on it based on the charts that we saw here, right? It, they called it, Bank of America called it, quote, overcrowded. But I think really when you think about what strategists have sort of been telling us about that mag seven trade right now is... It depends on what stocks we're talking about within the MAG7, right? Because we've sort of become mm -hmm. bifurcated a little bit where you talk about a Tesla, maybe even Apple slumping a little bit to start the year. But some of these companies like NVIDIA or Microsoft, Meta have done, Amazon have done so much better that you're really starting to see those groups separate. And then, I don't know, maybe the MAG7 trade gets less crowded, but the MAG4 trade gets more crowded, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Josh, we're going to be watching this closely as we get closer to the start of today's trading activity. We're just seconds away here. Of course, the day of the big CPI prints that came in just a little bit hotter than expected here, impacting major averages. We're seeing that going into the open. Here's a live look at the opening bell. And there you're seeing the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ up on your screen. Ticker symbol SUN, S-O-N, ringing the opening bell at the NYSC, and you've got a little funfetti in the air, a little flare there for what I believe is Spire Therapeutics ringing the opening bell at the NASDAQ here. Of course, we've got all around coverage of some of the moves that we're tracking here pre-market and even as we see the opening cross here today. We're still down across the board is where we begin today's trading activity. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills is on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Plus, Jared Blickery is on standby at the Interactive. Today is hotter than expected CPI print, giving investors a reality check. Maddie, you've got a guest on the floor with you. What are you hearing around the exchange? Yeah, a sea of red, as you mentioned, across the major industry indices, including the Russell. Yields are up as well. But I wanted to grab our expert guest here, Michael Ranking, senior market strategist here at the NYSE, to talk about that hotter than expected CPI print. And Michael, talk to me about your reaction and what the vibe has been on the floor this morning reacting to that CPI print. Yeah, I mean, obviously the CPI number came in hotter than expected, right? That does throw kind of a monkey wrench in this broader narrative, you know, that we were going to kind of see the end of the tightening cycle and the really aggressive assumptions that markets had in terms of rate cuts, you know, kind of going through this year. You know, just before I came over, I was looking at kind of, um, you know, the uh, probabilities for rate cuts, right? We're now looking at uh, um, uh, May at about one in three uh, probability of a rate cut, down from about two in three, you know, last week. And then uh, for the through year end, we're looking at about 75 basis points, uh, which is more in line with where the Fed has been, right? So you've seen kind of the, the Fed had kind of you know, taken some of those expectations out of the market, and now we're seeing the economic data do that. You know, one of the things I talked about throughout this year is that I thought you know, kind of economic data would be the cause of volatility, and, and we are seeing that today. 
at this point, can the market price in the exact date that we're going to see rate cuts start to come? No, I mean, I, th I mean, I think it's 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 really kind of a you know it, it continues to move, and we're going to be very data dependent. And you can see, you know, with today, you know how you know how you can see, you know, um, you kind of some of that data, you know, kind of uh, you know start to move in the wrong direction, and just how quickly markets will react to that. And the VIX was up this morning. Talk to me about your take on why we're seeing more movement in the VIX. Is it just that CPI print, or is there something more going on under the surface? Yeah. So I mean, I think you know, yesterday I thought was like you know a, a really telling moment. So we saw markets were moving higher throughout much of the morning, and the VIX was also moving higher. So whether that was somebody you know trying to hedge a portfolio ahead of this event, you know, or potentially just kind of you know you know making a call on this number, right? There was something going on there. Um, and that was like a little bit of a red flag for me. Now, the, the fact that it's also options expiration is going to potentially add to some of the, you know, the volatility and kind of the, the thrust that we see here, right? We saw, a, you know, a real expansion of breadth, you know, within the market yesterday, right? And this gap down is going to now just kind of leave traders in, you know, it, it trapped in some, you know, not particularly good positions. Continuing to have that question of where we're going to see the market broadening. Michael, thank you so much. We really appreciate your comments on that. Rochelle and Brad, back to you in the studio. All right, appreciate that. Our very own Madison Mills there at the NICE. Well, Jared Blickery also at home base here at the Interactive. So, Jared, what are you watching? I'm watching the small caps here. In fact, I'm watching all the indices, but the Russell 2000 down about 3.5%. And I've been tracking this over the last few days because, and by the way, this is a three-month chart. Last three days were huge green candle bullish days. And now we're seeing a little bit of a pullback here. Uh, I was a little bit excited about the break of this trend line here, but now we're right back at it. Sometimes this happens. You test it and then see if you can move on. I would remind people this is somewhat reminiscent of what happened exactly one month ago when we had the December CPI that was released in January. The headline number was, uh, was a little bit hotter than expected. Uh, the I think it was without uh, gas and also in food, it was a little bit, uh, it was as expected. So not quite the same, but nevertheless, it came in a little bit hot. We saw stocks take a little bit of a tumble in the morning, and then they rose at the end of the day or into the close here. Now, let me show you the 10-year T-note yield. This is important because it is breaking above what has been resistance, served as resistance for several weeks now. Higher interest rates, this can weigh on stocks, especially if the move is pretty quick the way we've been seeing. We can also take a look at the VIX. Matty uh, was just taking a look at that with a guest. We've had the VIX up several days in a row, so we're going to want to keep an eye on that. And then also the U.S. dollar. U.S. dollar has been at a crossroads here, and it is breaking higher. You can see this is the highest level it's been in months. So uh, bottom line is we're getting a little bit defensive here. I would remind viewers that February, the worst month of the year for the presidential election cycle. So it would be normal to take a bit of a pause here. Jared, thanks so much for really breaking all of that down. Some of the sector move here that we're tracking. Interesting energy, the lone bright spot okay. here on the day. Appreciate it, Jared. Well, major averages right now, they are down across the board. As the Dow is down 8 tenths of a percent. S&P 500, 1.3%. And the NASDAQ is down 2%. This comes after a hotter than expected CPI data and print that was released today, shaking investors' confidence in the strong market. But... This might be a small bump in the road for an overall bullish market for the year to begin things. For more on this, let's bring in Ryan Dietrich. Carson Group chief strategist is here. Ryan, help us make sense of this. You, you always have a good way of trying to give us at least one of the bright spots to, to hang our hat on. Yeah, good morning, Brad. Thanks for having me back. You know, listen, the S&P is up 14 in the last 15 weeks, up over 20% during that time. In the history of the S&P, we've never seen a rally like that over 15 months. We're 14, or I'm sorry, over 15 weeks. We're 14 or higher, up 20%. So this is historic. I, I want to build on what Jared just said because it's true. You look at, you know, seasonality's played out quite well. We're very overstretched. We know that. We can get into the CPI numbers. But I'm just saying we've been talking at our shop here, Carson, saying, listen, Maybe we're due for a well-deserved break. We've been bullish, right? We've been bullish. But when you look at it, like Jared just said, February is usually not that great, especially into an election year. And by the way, the fourth year of a new president, where we are right now, right about now, into, let's call it St. Patrick's Day, late you know, late March or so, historically can be a little, uh, little troublesome. So we're not overly concerned. We think it could be healthy to finally have a little break after the rally we've seen since late, uh, late October. It's true. It used to be hard to find a bear anywhere, uh, especially after the rally we've seen. But as you look at the reaction from markets then, is, is this an overreaction? Is there something else within the CPI data that's more concerning for them? 
Well, that's a great point. We've been looking at it for an hour now, specifically on CPI. I mean, it's all about shelter, right? I mean, it's not like a broken record here. Uh, you know, it's all—it's really all about shelter. And yes, as many other guests have been talking about, you look at some of the private data, different areas, we're seeing improvements in shelter. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure why the government's data is so different than some of the private data. We're still optimistic that we're going to see shelter start to come back. So just today, and Jared pointed it out, right? I mean, we had a little bit of a freak out with the last CPI number, but what are we seeing from PCE? It'll be real interesting what we're going to see from PPI. I believe that's on Friday. So this, believe me, CPI is very important. But there are other measures of inflation. I mean, just used cars. Used cars have been coming down drastically. The Mannheim used car index is down like 21% from, from the previous peak a couple of years ago on used cars. So believe me, this was worrisome. One final comment on you know today's numbers. Listen, January is volatile. We tend to see more revisions the month of January than just about any other month when it comes to a lot of economic data, specifically inflation data. So you know, I'm not Pollyanna here, but I, I think we're, we're, we're aware that you know this is just one data point. It's not a trend yet. So, Ryan, as you were mentioning a moment ago, kind of going into St. Patrick's Day, March, we could see some weakness. And in this kind of broader environment where we've heard many market strategists like yourself say, look for buy on the dip opportunities, where would the strongest buy on the dip opportunity emerge if we were to see that volatility or that weakness through the end of the first quarter? Yeah, great question there. I mean, listen, we, we've we been in the camp last year. I came on with you guys last year saying we didn't see a recession. Not as many people believe that then. Now more have clearly come on. So if you don't still, if you still don't see a recession, which is our base case, we would stick with the cyclical areas, right? We think industrials, we think financials, the areas that are starting to show some leadership here uh, can do a lot better. I mean, it's not like the news has been great when it comes to banks and financials, but they've hung in there pretty well overall. And I know today that Jared just talked about small caps are down significantly. They had the big three-day rally. We do think by the end of this year, Small and mid caps also should do um, should do better thanks to an economy that's going to avoid a recession. And yes, rate cuts are coming. We've always said the first cut would probably be in May. We said it'd probably be four cuts, not necessarily five or six, because the economy's stronger. And one final point on this: listen, I can talk on this on all day. Make it quick. Productivity has run at a 3.9% annualized rate the last three quarters. Guys, you got to go back to the mid-90s last time we had productivity like that. The truth is when you have higher productivity, wages stay high, the Fed can cut, and you don't have to worry about inflation soaring because you have a cap due to the higher productivity. So that is a key concept I don't think people have been talking about as much, and that's why we still think the Fed can cut, but again, starting in May. And Ryan, just quickly, as we head to the buzzer here on time, in terms of what you're seeing with forward earnings expectations, how should investors, what should they, what should they make of it and how should they really allocate their portfolio based on what they're hearing? Well, I mean, listen, this earnings season has been solid, right? All in all, we're looking at record earnings. I mean, you guys, your daily email yesterday shared a great chart from FactSet that showed fourth quarter earnings, you know, this upcoming fourth quarter, so almost a year from now, are expected to be up almost close to 20%. Now, there's a couple ways to look at that. Is that too high or is that too low? But the, the reality is if the economy's strong, we still think this earnings, why are so many economists now coming around to where we were? No recession, because earnings are strong, right? And we think there's still a strong earnings backdrop. So we're quick, real quickly, earnings going higher, CapEx is going higher, and profit margin is going higher. All three of those things trending higher. To us, that doesn't sound like a recession. Continue to buy the dip. So we might have a little more dip here. Let's be very clear. But we'd still be a buyer. Ryan Dietrich, Carson Group Chief Market Strategist. Thanks so much for taking the time, as always. Certainly do appreciate it. And for being a reading uh, a reader of our morning newsletter here at Yahoo Finance. Go. Appreciate it. Folks can see that QR code flash up on our screen all the time. Ryan, we always appreciate the time, too. Thank you. Thanks. Coming up. Shares of Shopify falling as the company's outlook for the year disappoints investors. We'll break down what the move means for your portfolio after the break.
Shopify beat analyst expectations in its fourth quarter with revenue of $2.14 billion and adjusted earnings per share of $0.34. Cents. But the stock is under pressure this morning, down about 8.5% as its outlook failed to impress the street. We have Gil Luria, DA Davidson Managing Director, with us for more. So we have seen that some of these companies still not getting rewarded for their beats here. What, what, so when you have a company like Shopify disappointing then, what are your big takeaways? Well, this is really one of those situations where expectations were so high coming into the quarter that there really wasn't much way that they could meet them. The stock is is up 10% just a week from a week ago, meaning where the stock is right now is where it was a week ago, um, as people expected them to deliver another fantastic result. Now, they did. The fourth quarter was uh, as impressive as it can be in the sense they grew 30% if you exclude the um, the logistics business they spun off while reducing expenses by 22% over last year. That's an incredible feat. It's just that they can't replicate that in 2024, and that's why the stock's pulling back now. They will grow very fast this year. They'll grow margins and profitability as well just not as much as last year. I mean, this this shifting e-commerce marketplace has certainly been something that they've leaned into and, and had a great strategy to execute here, Gil. What do they need to do to iterate on top of that now for that next kind of inflection point of growth, even though investors seem like they're not satisfied with perhaps enough of that continued acceleration in the growth? Yeah, the Shopify growth story has a lot of layers. The, the first and foremost, they leverage the growth in e-commerce. The growth in e-commerce is still double-digit growth on a global basis. They're leveraged to that. Beyond that, they've been able to take some price increases last year. They'll take more this year in different categories. They're increasing the penetration of the payments product, so they're growing in, on top of that. And then they're adding incremental services, uh, B2B services, offline commerce, and more advertising type services and campaign services. So their growth is gonna be above and beyond the growth of e-commerce this year and going forward because they can expand the wallet share of the retailers they're winning over. So Gil, with that in mind then, are investors not looking at this company properly in terms of the long-term uh, up upside that you see here? I think investors are giving it a lot of credit and will continue to do so. Shopify has one of the highest multiples in software, and deservedly so, because that growth pattern that we just described with a very long runway and market leadership well above and beyond anybody else are things that uh, investors are attracted to and will continue to be attracted to. Again, stepping back, the stock is double where it was a year ago. So they're doing very well uh, in terms of the financial performance, but also the share price has done very well, today's pullback notwithstanding. And so Gil, when you think about the investments that they're making in innovation, especially incorporating AI, some of the, some of the things that they have a competitive edge over, especially when it comes to getting more small businesses online, are they making enough investments, do you think, in innovation that investors are seeing the payoff from? They will be this year. So they've made innovations in the past. Last year, they pulled back a lot as they did a big headcount reduction. Again, they were still able to grow very fast. This year, they're re-engaging in that investment in generative AI and AI are important aspects of that. They want to make sure that their merchants have the tools that Amazon does. That's the whole reason Shopify is there, so merchants can compete with Amazon and they can only do that going forward if they do have the AI tools that, that uh, Amazon will clearly have going forward. Amazon just announced a Rufus AI assistant. Shopify may not be able to do that, but it still can increasingly provide those tools for merchants so they can stay competitive with Amazon. It, there, there's so much focus on empowering merchants from Shopify's story, but what is the read through to the consumer resilience that we've seen as well from these earnings that you can gather, Gil? So e-commerce is still strong. That's very important. It was very strong in the fourth quarter over the holiday season and their guidance implies they don't expect that to weaken. But this is, uh, e-commerce is obviously only one slice of the global retail and consumption trend. So I wouldn't read too much into it. I think we've had a lot of retailers report mixed results so far. 
And I think that's probably more indicative of where we're at. Shopify is doing so well that I wouldn't necessarily read uh, anything positive beyond what's going on there. Gil Loria, who was the DA Davidson Managing Director. Gil, always a pleasure to get some of your time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Coming up, shares of Coca-Cola rising this morning after beating on revenue expectations. We're going to ask an analyst whether Cherry Coke is better than Cherry Pepsi, plus whether or not the beverage stock is a buy for your portfolio. That's next. Watching shares of Coca-Cola shares edging higher this morning, the food and beverage giant One Americans know very well in their household cupboards, beat the street's revenue expectations, showing consumers are still buying cans of Coke despite those higher prices. For a deeper dive on Coca-Cola's earnings, we're joined by Gerald Pascarelli, Wedbush Senior Vice President and Equity Research Analyst. Thank you for joining us this morning. So we saw this earnings in line, sales with a beat, driven by those higher prices, but lower volumes in North America. How well is the consumer handling this based on what you're seeing from Coca-Cola? Thanks. Thanks very much for, for having me. Um, you know, when you look at the pricing trends that, that most of these soda companies have taken over the past two years to combat commodity inflation, volumes, you know, have, have been down in, in many instances, but they're broadly holding in uh, relatively well. And so, you know, I think the, the broad expectation is that um, as these double digit pricing increases start to, and they're they're continuing to moderate, but as they come down over the course of 2024, 
And over the longer term, in theory, that should result in some better um, some better volume performance as, as a driver behind the revenue algorithm. Jared, Gerald, where are you seeing kind of the strongest segment within this portfolio uh, that, that Coke has that's really helping margins at the end of the day? Yeah, I mean they're they're just getting really strong top line growth in 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 many of their international uh, countries. I think Europe was up twenty five, uh, up you know twenty percent plus as was Latin America. Um, but even so, like in in North America, they're able to 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 still flow through um, you know a good amount of pricing, which which inherently will benefit their margins. So you know international tends to outperform on the top line, um, but you know with with pricing where it is, uh, a lot of this internationally is to combat um, you know uh, currency currency headwinds, um, but the pricing still strong, margins are holding up strong. Um, so it's it's pretty much broad based. And speaking of that, because we did see um, in their report that EPS performance included the impact of a 14-point currency headwind, while comparable EPS performance included an impact of a 13-point currency headwind. Do we expect that to continue as we're sort of seeing what's been happening with at least some of the worst fears about a global recession tape tempering back? Yeah, I mean, with with Coke relative to the other large soda manufacturers, they're always going to be more exposed to uh, fluctuations in currency just because about two-thirds of their business is international. Um, the currency impact uh, was admittedly higher than than we were expecting. Um, when you look at the um, the movements in spot across key currencies, it's actually become more favorable over the course of um, of of four Q really through December. And so, you know, headed into this print, we actually thought. Um, that their FX outlook, they're currently calling for a two to three point impact on the top line and a four to five point impact on the bottom line. Uh, we thought that that was going to become more favorable, but really what's happening is they have a handful of hyperinflationary markets um, where they're not able to price through um, you know, the, the, the currency headwinds. And that's, that's driving the bulk um, of their current outlook. But you know, if, if you look at a four to five, on earnings, that that will be more favorable uh, than last year. And if there's one thing that that Coke has shown historically, it's you know if you do get meaningful movements in spot, they they will revise uh, you know that line item upwards uh, or downwards depending on which way the uh, which way the spots go. So that that will likely change over the course of the year. Gerald, got to hustle to our finish here, but you were able to listen in on this call as well. Anything in the tone that stuck out to you from the management team at Coke? I just think they're they're really confident in their ability to execute. You know, headed into this print, um, just based on consolidated volume growth, where where Coke has 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 proven that it can consistently grow volumes um, at a time where you know volume growth for for many competitors has has remained elusive. Um, they're getting that, and and they expect to continue to get it. And so we had thought that they were best positioned going in, um, just given the balance of of their revenue. Um, you know, to be to be balanced between volumes and pricing, which they likely get in 2024, um, and they're they're always able to generate uh, productivity and and operating efficiencies to drive some leverage. So it was a really good guide, uh, you know, coming in above kind of the high end of um, their long term or uh, coming in above their uh, their their long term algorithm on both the top and bottom line. And I think the shares are being rewarded as a result. Gerald Pascarelli, who is the Wedbush Senior Vice President and Equity Research Analyst covering beverages and cannabis. Gerald, thanks so much for taking the time here today. Thank you. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Happy top of the 10 a.m. hour, everyone. Brad Smith here alongside Rochelle Okufo. You are watching Yahoo Finance Live. We are about 31 minutes into today's trading activity. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up. Stocks are in the red, sliding away from recent highs as investors digest a hotter than expected January inflation report. That's right. And also taking a look at some individual trending tickers, shares of Biogen under pressure this morning. That's after reporting lower revenue and profits in its fourth quarter compared to a year ago. The pharmaceutical company seeing sales slump in its biggest drug category, multiple sclerosis therapies. And Molson Core shares under pressure this morning despite a swing back to profitability in the company's fourth quarter. The beer seller saw earnings of 48 cents per share compared to a loss of $2.63 a share a year ago. Boosted by higher sales as the company gained market share in 2023 amid boycotts against Bud Light. And shares of Krispy Kreme slipping after missing expectations for profit in its fourth quarter and offering guidance that lagged consensus estimates. Shares of the donut maker currently off. As you can see, they're just about almost 7% on the day. Well, Marriott International reporting better than expected earnings for the fourth quarter, but a miss on revenue and lower than expected profit guidance is overshadowing the beat on the bottom line. Shares of Marriott, M-A-R is the ticker symbol there. They're down by about 4.7%. Here to discuss... We've got Baird's Senior Research Analyst, Michael Belisario. Michael, great to have you here with us today. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, want to get your read through on this report and what investors perhaps are, are sour on within this particular print. Uh, thanks. Good morning. Um, I think the big thing you think about the market being down a percent and Marriott's 2024 EPS guidance being about 3% below street expectations you add that together, it's 4%. That's kind of roughly what the stock is down. So not totally surprised to see the stock weaker. I think when you peel back all the moving pieces that they had with a bunch of different uh, line items in the fourth quarter, underlying trends are somewhere between good to still pretty darn solid. Uh, we like to say people are traveling. They're just traveling to different markets on different days of the weeks for uh, different purposes. So travel is still strong. Uh, and really, some of the weakness just has to do with expectations, the stock being at an all-time high and 27 times earnings leading up to the print. So, Michael, when you sort of divvy up the pie in terms of the expectations that the markets had g going into this versus some of the fundamental subsectors of what you're seeing within the actual business, where do you think that balance lies? Well, there's some questions around leisure travel and still the sustainability of, of, of demand there, especially given all the, the headlines. Uh, but leisure demand remains solid in the aggregate. That's the best performing customer segment, albeit growth there is the slowest. Where you're seeing the recovery still unfold is Asia, uh, China in particular, and then in the U.S., urban markets, group, convention business is still pretty strong. Companies are spending money. You're probably traveling a little bit less for the one-day trip, and you're seeing more of this uh, group and small meeting demand, and that's really robust, and that's benefiting Marriott's portfolio. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And we were speaking with the Hilton CEO, Chris Nacetta, about that last week, that business transient is how they classify it, the biggest segment of their business, and particularly where he expects that to strengthen. Is that something that you expect to be a rising tide for the overall industry? And, and who is the kind of largest winner in that particular uh, rebound in corporate travel, especially as we're kind of looking across the, the margins that would then trickle back through to some of the accommodation space? Well, business travel historically has been uh, the biggest contributor to uh, hotel profitability. Uh, it's a little bit smaller now because leisure has gotten bigger and, and business is still recovering. But think about when someone's traveling on a, on a corporate expense. The, it, you, you're a bit of a price taker. You book one day, three days, five days ahead of time, and, and you go to the city you're going to because you have to. So it's highly profitable business. Um, and you know, business travel, the expectation is that it will continue to steadily recover. Uh, and Marriott benefits from that. Marriott, compared to some of the other global hotel brand peers, more hotels in urban gateway markets, more bigger box convention and group centric hotels, too. So they're they're poised to benefit and capture uh, a disproportionate share of that demand as it, as it continues to recover in 24. So, Michael, when you do compare Marriott to some of its peers, then, are there perhaps more attractive um, hotel brands that you like? Uh, so we're neutral rated on Marriott. We're outperform uh, on Hilton. 
really when you take a step back, the, the two businesses are very similar. Uh, when you talk to industry participants, it's really 1A and 1B in the industry and everyone else. Some people will say Hilton Marriott, other people will say Marriott Hilton. Um, you know, we like to pick one of them because uh, we we have to give something to our investors to pick from, uh, but but really they're they're very similar. And if there is any difference, Marriott's a little bit more urban, a little bit more group centric. There's a little bit more operating leverage in Marriott's model versus Hilton, um, but but very similar. And then we also cover Choice and Wyndham and Hyatt. Those are more mid cap names, uh, particularly Wyndham and Choice are focused on the, the lower end chain scales, which is interesting because. Hilton and Marriott and Hyatt have introduced new conversion and new build mid-scale brands and, and Hilton's uh, introduced premium economy. So they're going to where the white space is that is Marriott, Hilton and Hyatt are and uh, that's benefiting their growth rates as well. Is there any read through that we can extrapolate from Marriott earnings today, Hilton earnings last week that can prepare us for Airbnb when they report? Well, Airbnb is predominantly leisure focused and leisure trends are still solid, but the growth rate is what has slowed. For Airbnb, it, 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 I mean, it, it's sort of the Kleenex and Xerox, right? It's 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 the global brand that everyone knows, you Airbnb it. Uh, and it's about a total addressable mar uh, market for them and continuing to grow uh, their share globally. But their growth rates will be dictated by the leisure traveler. And what you see from Hilton and Marriott is cross-border, international business and group is what is growing faster than leisure. And some of that is simply just normalizing post pandemic trends. And that's that's what we've seen recently from Airbnb. And that's what you should expect to continue. And Michael, as we continue to look at some of these post pandemic trends, obviously we still have that, that pent up travel demand. Most of that seems to be out of the way then. So what is really the driving force here going forward? Well, for the hotel, for the stocks in particular, net unit growth is, at least on a normalized basis, will be growing faster than RevPAR growth. The public market uh, has really valued net unit growth. The consistency there, uh, Hilton and Marriott, for example, the majority of their net unit growth is new construction. If something is in the ground and being built, it will almost certainly deliver this year, next year, the following year. So the public market can look out a couple of years and ascribe a pretty robust uh, multiple to that piece of business. Uh, and that's what's changed uh, compared to seven, eight years ago when net unit growth was lower. Marriott's global share is 7% and uh, it's in the teens in the US. So uh, it's not as if they're bumping up against uh, obstacles uh, in terms of growth, but really the white space for them is, is international and the, the net unit growth and the consistency there and the acceleration off of the lows that we saw in 22 and 23 is what is really going to drive this stock. But uh, we said this in our preview notes last week, expectations were high. Both Hilton and Marriott were essentially at all time highs leading up to the prints. The stocks were up in a straight line over the last three months. And both of them were trading in the high 20s, nearly 30 times earnings. You, you sort of needed perfect reports and better than better than expected updates. And we didn't necessarily get that from either of them. Yeah, tough to get better than better than expected. <laughs> Appreciate you joining us with your insights. Michael Belisario, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, let's get you a quick check of how the markets are faring. We're currently looking at the Dow off about 530 points. They're currently at session lows. S&P 500 also down about 1.5%. Tech-heavy Nasdaq also selling off their down almost just over 290 points. All right, coming up, shares of Restaurant Brands International edging lower this morning. That's after reporting Q4 results. We'll bring you the reason behind the move after the break.
Shares of restaurant brands International moving to the downside this morning, as despite beating on the top and bottom line in the fourth quarter, the company is seeing system-wide sales growth signaling the continued strength of the consumer. Let's bring in Andrew Charles, TD Cowan, Senior Research Analyst, to discuss more. Thank you for joining us this morning. So, so talk about the reaction that you're seeing in the stock price here and what this means about consumer resilience, this story that we keep continuing to hear in earnings. Absolutely. So good morning. So on the positive, we were very pleased with Burger King U.S. same store sales of 6.4 percent, uh, exceeded investor expectations for around a six or so, and the published sell side estimates around a five. Then Tim Hortons Canada, uh, really the big surprise this quarter, 8.7 percent same store sales growth. Expectations were firmly for a five. We we're also very pleased with the disclosure around the home market uh, franchisee profitability that surged for BKUS and fared very well for both Popeyes as well as for Tim Hortons. The stock reaction you're seeing today, I think, reflects a noisy EBITDA, B, uh, EBITDA miss that we saw largely due to a true up, true up excuse me, for the Tim Hortons um, supply chain business combined as well with some headwinds that the Burger King business faced in the Middle East uh, as well as Western Europe and uh, China. I'd also point out as well that during the conference call, the company tempered the rate of development for 2020. Uh, for net restaurant growth of 4.5% roughly from expectations of 5% before, largely due to China. So two kind of conflicting dynamics today, very solid performance in the home markets, some more noise on EBITDA as well as on the uh, outlook for uh, unit growth. How does that restaurant development also kind of uh, flow through in, even into the franchisee story for this company? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think of, think of the unit growth as more of an output uh, for the efforts they're putting into place and the strength you're seeing for the U.S. Um, and Can Tim Hortons Canada franchisee development. You know, particularly for Burger King U.S., it's fewer closures that are being guided to for 2024 versus 2023. And then the development story here, really an inter international story. Yes, you have some white space uh, for, for the big brands in their home markets, particularly for, for Popeyes, but really about the unit growth expansion opportunity international, where, where it's very fertile for growth. Uh, China was cited, though, as the key reason for tempering the unit development pace uh, for 24 versus 23. And are you getting any indication of how the sands might change going forward? We've already seen sort of slower uh, consumer consumption in China, a leading market that a lot of these companies still trying to expand when it comes to fast food and fast casual. Yeah, it's it's. Um... In terms of a blanket answer, we know, we know the coffee business in China has been one where you're seeing irrational competitors um, that are lower priced relative to a Starbucks, for instance. And because coffee is such a high margin product, because uh, the competitors are um, seeing economies of scale from rapid growth, uh, as well as from franchising, which is also providing some cash flow as well for them. Uh, the coffee market's probably showing to be the most competitive, you know, as it relates to kind of the hamburger and, and uh, fried chicken market in China. Uh, broadly speaking, you know, that's been one where uh, you're seeing more value competition heating up in those markets. Um, harder just given that the gross margin profile of hamburger and, and fried chicken, not as good as uh, as coffee. So the discounts can't be as uh, as irrational. But China as a whole is clearly showing signs of slowing and in the coffee business in particular, uh, more competition that's really flowing into that. You know, when we think about these companies, what, what do they need to show the consumer in terms of menu innovation in order to retain uh, the, the consumer spend, the, the appetite and, and mind share uh, as we're looking at a consumer that's looking for deals, looking for value, uh, even in all of their purchases, especially within this food away from home category? Yes, I've learned a long time ago that, that brands are known for what they're known for. So what I mean by that is if you see Popeyes uh, doing an extension with chicken wings that were permanently reintroduced in November, that's been cited as doing very well for them. You know, Burger King right now really leaning in hard to the Whopper. These are core equities of the business that uh, I would expect to continue to really bear fruit as we're bullish on the outlook you know, for restaurant brands going forward. Uh, you know, I, I would say what's really off brand is when you see intensified discounts, when you see menu innovation that really isn't in a brand's lane. That, that's where I'd say it's a bit more worrisome. We're not seeing any signs of that here, though. And I do want to ask, because last week we spoke with Jack Hartung, Chipotle's CFO, about what we're seeing in terms of wage pressure. Here's what he had to say about the minimum wage increase in California coming into play. When that many people are going to get a significant raise, it's going to have a ripple effect. It is going to make things more expensive. I do think it's going to have an inflationary impact and make it a little tougher to go to the grocery store or stay at a hotel uh, and, of course, eat at a restaurant, whether it's an independent restaurant or a chain restaurant. 
So, Andrew, do you think that, um, that, that when you look at the pricing for QSR, are they factoring in some of, these, some of these added expenses? How much is that going to end up getting perhaps passed on to franchisees as well as consumers? Yeah, so as it relates to the California Fast Act, or better known as AB 1228, on April 1st, you're going to see the minimum for a limited service restaurant with 60 plus locations across the country set at $20 an hour. And so what we expect is that at an industry level, it depends if a restaurant wants to offset the dollar impact of labor, in which case is about a 5% price increase they're going to need to take. If they want to neutralize the percentage uh, impact to margins, it's more like an 8% price increase that's needed here. So uh, broadly speaking, our checks in the field suggest that's going to be the case by and large across the industry, a 5 to 8% price, cr price increase on average in the state of California. Jack's right. I mean, the ripple effect this sends for um, someone who's going to work in a different industry and you name it, fitness, dry cleaning, retail, whatever it might be, you know, that worker is certainly going to get a, get a raise as well. So pricing throughout California probably will get impacted by this. But at the same time, um, a cosmetic or a market equilibrium wage increase is coming to give the consumer some more pricing power, to give some more the consumer uh, some more purchasing power. So, you know, uh, a lot of speculation on what that's going to mean come April 1st. We're very curious, obviously, when it happens, what transpires thereafter. Andrew, invite me to some of those checks in the field. I'll go on a QSR ride along. Look, just, <laughs> come, just tell me when. Come hungry, please. Yes. Oh, will do. Andrew Charles, TD Cowan, Senior Research Analyst. Thanks so much for taking the time today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Let's do a quick check of the markets here as we're seeing some of the losses steepen on the day. You're taking a look at the Dow down by about 530 points, S&P 500 down 1.4%, NASDAQ off of session lows but still down 1.7%, 271 points is what that equates to. And coming up, a leadership shakeup at Expedia. We're going to speak with the company's CEO, Peter Kern. It's next.
A leadership shakeup announcement sent Expedia shares down over 20% following its fourth quarter results. Its biggest decline since March of 2020, the change leaving the street skeptical about the travel brand's strategic direction ahead. Peter Kern, Expedia CEO, joins us now alongside Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sazi. Peter, great to have you here in studio with us Good today. Good to be here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's focus on this earnings report first before we get into this transition that's going to be taking sure. place. I mean, this was, as you mentioned in this report, a record result here, particularly for this most recent quarter and the full year guidance driving that. So ultimately here, as you're sensing and looking through this travel environment, what is the outsized catalyst? that you're expecting for the, for the course of 2024? Yeah, well, I think for us, it's all the work we've put in for the last several years. I talked a lot about it at earnings, but we've been going through a massive transformation. I've talked to Brian about it a few times. Uh, technologically, how we go to market with our brands, our new loyalty program, service, everything, basically, over the last three years. Uh, and so the catalyst for us is really that work is starting to germinate into real results. And it takes a little while to get going. It's not a light switch. but. We've revamped the front end. All the technology has changed. We can experiment and launch features much faster to improve the consumer experience. We have AI and machine learning throughout the product so we can personalize faster and faster and faster. And those things just get better all the time. So the catalyst for us is our own internal work. The markets are slowing a bit. The travel markets, you know, it's still growing, but it's the post-COVID thing. The, is slowing down a bit, so the acceleration is lower. But as the market decelerates, we expect to continue to accelerate, and that's basically what we told the street. Is the deceleration more overseas than the U.S. or, or vice versa? Well, the U.S. and Western Europe were the first out of COVID, and they grew a lot. Uh, Asia, but that slowed. And then Asia and Latin America, they, they relaunched. So really, Asia and Latin America have been driving this past year more than anything, and that's all slowing down. So everything's going to come back to sort of a more normal level. There will still be some outsized growth in some of those places. China's still growing a lot. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's really just a desale of the, the whole globe back to sort of more normal post-COVID levels. And, uh, and again, we've been rebuilding ourselves while most of our competitors have just been steady as she goes. So we think we're in a place to start to accelerate out of this against a slightly tougher macro market than post-COVID, which was bananas. But, um, but we're, we're really excited about where we're at. And Peter, I have to ask you about generative AI because it's also empowered a lot of people to not have to go through platforms to book some of their travel as well. How is Expedia viewing that? And what's the competitive edge that you think you have as a platform versus people planning their own travel that way? Yeah, so it's a good planning feature. It's not a booking feature. And we have it woven into the front end of our app as well so that people can basically get in and discover in our app or outside our app. But when you need to know what the price is, are there rooms on that day? Can you get a plane on that day? Can you get the seats you want? You need us. And we have way more personalized data about travel and what our consumers have done and what they've booked, where they've been. So if you want a truly personalized experience, yes, Google or Ch ChatGPT might know some things about you through what you've asked it. But in terms of what you've done historically, what you really like, uh, how we help you through the whole process. It's really a discovery tool more than it is a booking tool. And so what we're trying to do is weave generative AI and all AI and machine learning throughout our experience. Sometimes you want to ask lots of like open-ended questions. I'm going to Paris, what should I do? Other times you're really asking much more specific things where you're trying to compare things. You want personalized answers. You like boutique hotels, I like resorts, whatever it is. And so we're able to do that. And in each case, we're using AI and machine learning to use the best tool for the problem and basically solve it through the journey for you, including service, which we've made huge strides in and have the best service in the category. I think you made a really great point, Peter, on the earnings call, um, that you have reset the company, you and your team. So then why not partake in some of the benefits of that reset, which theoretically would come this year and next year? Look, it's a great company. I could stay here forever. I, I love the people. I love the team we've put together. I have complete faith in them. Uh, we've rebuilt the place. We're 50% product and tech now. We're in 19. We were 30% product and tech. So we're, we've totally refocused the company and put ourselves in a new place to compete and win. Um, 
but I had a four-year deal. I came off the board to do this. I was vice chairman, as you recall. I'm going back to being vice chairman, so I'm not going anywhere. Um, but really, as I saw where we were, and particularly in the back half of last year, beginning of this year, as we're accelerating a lot technologically, I just felt like the company was in a good place for a handoff. And I'm a big believer in good transitions. You know, you don't want to outstay your welcome, and you, and you know, you need to build a team that can keep going and going. What's and going. critical to making a su successful transition? Because uh, we have a lot of examples out there, Disney, you name it, where the transition hasn't been very well. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, I think the company has to be ready. I think you need the right people at the right time. Um, you know, I think what we just went through, I was, I was the right person for it. You need to be tenacious. We had a lot of messy things to do, and, uh, and we had to rebuild the right team and, and put in the right place. That's a combination of people who have been here a long time, like Arion, who's terrific, and a lot of new people who have added to the puzzle. So I think you've got to build it right. You got to set it up right, and in my opinion, you got to go in the right way, which is in part is this transition where I'm not going yet. I'm here for three more months. Ariane will take over. We'll get the company set. Um, everybody will be excited. And as I told the company, you know, I'm going to be busting my butt every day till I leave, and I expect the same from them. So, it's amazing. Well, we're going to be tracking, of course, that transition and continuing to track the company as well. One thing that we're we're also keeping tabs on right now is this issue that, that Boeing has had to move through and whether or not that's actually trickled through from the data that you can see to bookings. As you look at the current quarter and where customers have perhaps soured because of the Boeing and the 737 MAX 9 issue with Alaska Airlines that now means that many of those aircrafts are grounded. Many of the flight schedules are changed. Has that impacted in, in one direction or another travel from what you're seeing on the leisure side? Yeah, it's definitely had an impact. I don't think it's scared everybody off planes or anything, but uh, there are fewer planes to fly. Uh, that becomes an issue. Uh, some people probably were scared by it. We saw some early reaction to it. Um, we'll see how that comes back. But, you know, anything, a geopolitical problem, something like Boeing, all of these things tend to have a reaction. They can be different in different places. Um, but for sure, there's a little less supply in, in the air, airline market now and, uh, and a little fear, probably. And, uh, and it's had a modest impact. Air has been slowing, particularly in North America. Uh, price, it's the one place, one of a few places, car rentals, where prices have actually come down um, post-COVID. And, uh, and so those... You, that means there was more supply than, than the market really could AVs. absorb. Uh, yeah. That's just no, no, come on. Yeah. Come on. Just, let's be honest. <laughs> Maybe. That's, that's what it is. And in terms of the demographic that Expedia is looking at in this multi year transformation, yeah. How are you factoring in, obviously, a lot of people have very tight purse strings at the moment in terms of how they're spending this discretionary money. Are the particular demographics that you see the most value in? Yeah, I mean, we, we've, one of the journeys we've made is to focus on lifetime value of customers. You've heard that a lot from technology companies, I'm sure. But we've really, as we've combined our data and understood the customer better, we've gotten a much better ability to understand the value of a customer. We're seeing across the board, you know, travel is still quite solid, strong. You know, I said it's decelerating, but it's very solid still. And, um, and there's a little trade down in the bottom end of the market. There's a little more pressure there, as we've seen in other you know, consumer goods. Uh, the middle and upper part of the market of travel is, makes up a lot of all the travel dollars. And we're quite strong there, always have been. So uh, I think that will continue to be true. That part of the market, mid and upper market, will be really strong. The bottom may see a little pressure. But there's lots of solutions for people. There's lots of deals out there. We have member discounts. There's lots of ways for them to make their dollar go further. So. Uh, so I think you're still going to see travel. You just might see some adjustment within it a little bit. Uh, I th you mentioned, uh, again, I think it was on the earnings call, your share count back to 2015 levels. Today, news came out that a trip advisor exploring alternatives. Do you think assets like yours are just undervalued because there is a consolidation opportunity? I don't think that's why, no. I, I, think, uh, I think we're undervalued because we did some painful stuff that not everybody understood along the way. And we used the opportunity to just buy back our stock today. You know, this week's reaction to me or whatever the street was reacting to, just another opportunity for us to continue to buy our stock uh, at an undervalued price. I think, uh, I think what people have to see with us, I think stories are different. TripAdvisor's got a different set of assets, different things they're dealing with. For us, it was really rebuilding and seeing what that rebuild could drive. For, we believe it's going to drive share growth. It's going to drive share as in share of the market growth. Uh, we think it's going to drive accelerated growth compared to peers. Uh, that's what we set ourselves up to do. We weren't in a position to do that before. And, you know, we, having to prove it's fair, we got to go prove it. But we obviously believe, and that's why we've been buying our stock.
And are you going to have time for a little holiday before, before the God, big move? I, I hope. Well, not before the big move. <laughs> this guy's still, this guy's <laughs> still working. Come after on. After the big on, move, I'm working. planning a holiday. So I'll have a nice summer, I hope. Fair enough. Hope right you enough. do, too. Thank you. Appreciate you joining us this morning. Peter Kern, Expedia CEO, alongside Yahoo Finance's executive editor, our very own Brian Sozzi. All right, well, let's get you a quick check of the markets. Still seeing uh, red across the board here, though, off the session lows, at least for the Dow, you see it's currently still down about 470 points, or 1.2%. S&P 500 also down about 1.2%, or 60 points. The tech-heavy Nasdaq also down about 214 points, or about one or a third of a percent. All right, well, do stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Stay with us. Consumer staples in focus this week as we see a number of companies report their quarterly results. Coca-Cola out this morning beating the street's revenue expectations, showing consumers are still buying cans of Coke despite those higher prices. And we saw similar results in the last month from Colgate and Procter & Gamble, both showing higher sales thanks to increased prices. Our next guest is tracking both of those companies, Olivia Tong, Raymond James, Senior Consumer Staples Analyst. Thank you for joining us this morning. So what have we learned so far this earnings season about the state of the consumer and any sort of trade-offs we're starting to see? 
Sure. Thanks again for having me. I think a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, organic sales is still very strong. Um, you know, you see very strong sales growth across consumer staples, across beauty, particularly in the U.S. The consumer has been pretty resilient. They've stuck to their brands uh, and they are looking for value, but continue to look uh, for, for, uh, for growth, both in terms of price and mix. Volume is starting to recover off of some pretty tough comps, but, uh, but we continue to, to be quite bullish on, on the sector. Where, where is the strongest element within this sector as of right now, as we're starting to, and as Rochelle was mentioning, some of the reports that came through this morning, really kind of giving us a sense of where these companies are continuing to push price through versus where they're just trying to make sure that they're maintaining market share? Sure. Um, I think, you know, uh, quite frankly, we like the multinationals or the domestics. We went into the year thinking that, um, and you're seeing that play out. Uh, Colgate grew faster than P&G this quarter, um, Coke over Pepsi. Um, now that said, uh, the other area that we do like is companies that cater to either the tail end, either tail end of the income uh, spectrum versus in the middle. So you think about a company like uh, Elf, for example, in beauty, uh, their average price points are in the six to seven dollar range. They grew sales 85 percent in the quarter. So uh, so you're really seeing consumers look for value at both ends of the spectrum. Either they want if they're willing to pay a premium, they want some value add associated with that or uh, or a, a, a fairly low price point. And and quite frankly, value associated with that as well. So Olivia, in terms of your top pick in staples and discretionary here, what, what are the standouts and why? Sure. Um, we do like Colgate, we do like Procter, and we do like Elf, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, with respect to, uh, to Colgate and Procter, we think that they will continue to grow faster than their peer set. Um, Colgate in particular has a lot of international exposure, 80 plus percent international exposure. So as you see, um, disproportionate amount of pricing uh, Colgate will benefit from that, whereas P&G is sort of your steady eddy, continue to grow uh, price and mix, uh, very strong in terms of innovation and, and very strong gross margin and operating margin improvement. And, and quite frankly, the gross margin has been so strong that they've been able to spend a lot of that back in terms of advertising and, and other brand support. Um, within the beauty area, we really do like Elf. That continues to really uh, resonate with us. We think there's a lot of white space opportunity there. Um, with respect to shelf space, international, different uh, um, different retailers as well. And they've been gaining shelf space and they continue to gain shelf space ac across a number of categories. So we are very bullish on Elf and think that there continues to be a lot of opportunity there, even with the tough comps. How, how much kind of a long tail do the little luxuries have, both for consumers and, and as a trading strategy for investors out there. We heard from the Edgewell CFO just a few days ago saying that consumers are still spending, spending on these little luxuries from their mm -hmm. purview and the data that they're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. So you see that across, um, I think beauty is the perfect example of that. And, and not surprisingly, you saw a couple of, of uh, beauty manufacturers advertising the Super Bowl this year. It was worth the $7 million. Uh, given that the audience is 50-50 male, female, and of course this year perhaps a little bit more uh, millennium, millennial, excuse me, Gen Z, Gen Alpha tilting than uh, than an average year. Um, so consumers do still like their little luxuries, and and quite frankly, you know, as you think about the the sector, um, the whole idea about um, services versus goods, well. Beauty sort of plays in the middle of that, right? Because um, there is a service component uh, and, and there's a good component. Uh, and there's been, and the companies have also been stepping up in terms of innovation, in terms of social media. All these different things are really working well together in order to, to drive that, that desirability in these products. And Olivia, I have to ask you about Estee Lauder because um, looking at the stock price down more than 44% over the mm -hmm. past year, what is the story there? What are they either not getting right versus say an elf? What do they need to do? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So part of it is uh, is the geographical exposure. Estee is um, disproportionately focused on China and travel retail. Obviously, travel has been um, has had their challenges in the past and still trying to get over that. There's been a lot of overstocking in terms of inventory that they've had to work down. Um, they are getting through that. They should be done with that by end of Q3. And then China, of course, as you know, has been a, uh, a challenging market um, and there's a lot of open inventory in there, but getting better uh, as well. So um, SA, we think over a longer term period does does recover 
from its current challenges, but but the near term is a little bit um, a little bit more challenging too. Olivia, great insights and analysis. Thanks so much for helping us break this down today. Olivia Tong, who is the Raymond James Senior Consumer Staples Analyst. Thanks so much. Thank you. My pleasure. A slew of earnings are out this week. We have you covered on what to watch for when Airbnb reports results after the bell today. Airbnb, a company that's become synonymous with travel and leisure. Airbnb is now a verb in its own. The last time the booking platform reported a solid performance, it was overshadowed by a less than rosy outlook for the fourth quarter. So what should you look out for this quarter? Here are three things you need to watch. Number one, booking growth. Looking out for two key metrics. First, gross booking value. That's the total amount of payments processed on the platform, everything from host payments to cleaning fees, but it does not include cancellations. Last quarter, gross booking value landed at over $18 billion, a 17% gain from the prior year. Then there's nights and experiences booked. The platform reported over 100 million bookings for the quarter, which topped Wall Street estimates. Now, as we turn to the fourth quarter, the revenue figure will be closely watched as the company guided a little below expectations. Number two, international expansion. In the last quarter, Airbnb said their expansion plans into international markets is gaining momentum. Keep an eye out on what is called underpenetrated markets. That means a market with little competition for the same service. Asia Pacific is one, but also take into account markets like Germany, Brazil, and Korea. Beyond that, it's important to have a pulse on anything the company has to say about AI and how it could be a game changer for international growth in the coming months. Lastly is regulation, another key area to watch. In the third quarter, Airbnb slightly saw higher prices for short-term rentals, but this area could be hurt by changes in the regulatory landscape. For example, New York City's new law requires all short-term rental hosts to register with the city. They must show when their guests are staying, and only two guests can stay at a time. This applies to all other platforms like Verbo and Booking.com. The big question here, will other cities follow suit? And what could it mean in the long term? There's a lot to digest as we look at Airbnb's fourth quarter earnings, and Yahoo Finance will be tackling the latest developments.
Not a ton of upside this morning for Hasbro. Shares of the toy maker falling after reporting fourth quarter earnings that missed expectations. Revenue declined 23% to a dollar, or excuse me, $1.29 billion. Adjusted earnings per share that came in at 38 cents versus the 64 cents that the street was looking for. Full year guidance for 2024 also disappointing investors. For more on the results and the year ahead, for Hasbro at least, and plus some of the other toy makers. We've got Zachary Waring, who is the CFRA analyst. Great to have you here, Zach. Let's first start with Hasbro here. I mean, it, it feels like, and our team in our newsroom meeting thought I was joking this morning, but hey, Wizards of the Coast, my goodness, that segment at least growing 7%, but there's some other warning spots within this report. Want to get your read. Yeah, I think for, for us, we see this as kind of a throw in the towel quarter. Um, they took a, a bunch of impairment charges Obviously, big revenue miss, bottom line miss. So, you know, miss across the boards. Guidance was very conservative, we think. So, we, you know, we think this quarter was kind of throwing the towel. Let's set expectations low going into 2024. I mean, and we expect them to beat uh, throughout 2024. We think they've, they've let, you know, given conservative guidance and they can beat easily. And Zachary, we know that... Um... In, in that earnings report, we saw uh, CEO Chris Cox talking about, you know, they have a healthier balance sheet entering into 2024, leaner cost structure, diverse portfolio here. When do we start seeing that payoff, I guess, longer term here? What are investors hoping for that they didn't get from this earnings report? Yeah, I think I think what the big thing was with the balance sheet was inventories are now back down to below 2019 levels. Um, they've started to pay down some debt. They've got some debt coming due in November, which we expect them to pay down, pay off, and not refinance. Um, and we think now, you know, they've kind of laid the groundwork to you know make some slow improvements through this year. You know, they've they've you know guided for basically down five percent revenues and. Um, some some improvement to, you know, operating margin. So, um, you know, we think the next few quarters are going to be big for the company. You know, we would worry if next quarter they reported a similar, you know, write down some impairment charges or goodwill. That would concern us. But we think that this is kind of the throw in the towel. You know, let's reset. And now we, we can be going, you know, moving forward. This is a company that's targeting 20% adjusted operating profit margin by 2027. How much of that banks on the digital gaming segment and the licensing that they're able to take on there and the build out for end users to flock in and perhaps make purchases on the content and then in-game or inexperienced purchases as well? Yeah, that would be that's huge. You know, um, digital is the only way that they can get to 20% operating margin. Obviously, you're not going to get that from consumer products. Um, which is currently their largest, you know, um, percentage of revenues. So, you know, digital is huge, and that's where they're investing a lot. Obviously, they've had success there. Um, they are, however, you know, expecting revenues to be slightly down this year because of some second half comps on licensing agreements. But, um, you know, we think that's where they're going to get it. Um, entertainment, obviously, they is now going to be much smaller as they've sold off their non-core entertainment business. So it's going to have to come from digital consumer products. Obviously, you know, that doesn't carry anywhere near a 20 percent operating margin. So um, you're exactly right. And of course, Zachary, uh, Mattel has been on the, mi on the minds of everyone, of course, because of the, the Barbie push as well. But you have a hold on Mattel and a strong buy on Hasbro. How do you see those stacking up against each other? Yeah, I think the difference is, you know, it's hitting the, the horse on the head here, but uh, digital. So that's kind of the difference between the two companies. Mattel has done a really good job in recent years to kind of expand margins and, and you know, be a more efficient company. Um, and Hasbro hasn't. So, you know, we liked Mattel a couple of years ago. Um, you know, they benefited from, you know, some costs cuts. And now we think it's Hasbro's turn. We also, like I said, we like the digital. So um, that's kind of the difference between the two for us. Just lastly, while we have you here, I mean, we, when we think about the number of films that are in the coffers for Mattel, what does that look like in terms of Hasbro and trying to make sure that on the content side, they've struck the correct deals in order to get and stay in front of fans out there that drives even more toy purchases? Yeah, we think entertainment's huge. So we, you know, it all ties in. So if you've got a bunch of kids watching your TV shows and movies, they're going to go out, their parents are going to buy them those products that they love. So, um, you know, that's, we thought that was why they bought E1 and it, and it was. Um, however, you know, E1 had a significant other business that wasn't, you know, geared toward maybe Hasbro's consumers. 
which they've gotten rid of now. And we think they'll start to really focus on those core TV shows and movies that are driving sales for their, their uh, consumer products business. Um, and it's huge. Uh, Mattel's done a really good job. Obviously, the Barbie movie was huge. Um, didn't really target their, you know, their consumer. Mattel, you know, targeted maybe a, a more of an adult um, to watch their movie for Barbie. But, um, you know, we like Hasbro. We think they're targeting the right audience. Um, Barbie obviously drove a lot of sales just because it was just huge all over the U.S., um, but we like Hasbro more just because they target actual their 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 consumer, their younger, you know, zero, you know, one through 15 age kids. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we think it's huge. It's a big part of their business. Zachary Waring, thanks so much for taking the time here to break down all things, the business of fun, the toys at the end of the day, things that we all grew up on. Zach, appreciate the time. Thanks for having me. Certainly. TaylorMade Golf and Tiger Woods Inc. a deal to launch a new lifestyle brand named Sunday Red. The partnership coming after Tiger Woods' recent split with Nike here and ultimately thinking through some of the logo, some of the apparel that's going to be coming forward here. There's been a lot of hang up and a lot of discussion online, at least in some of the circles that I've been tracking on this logo here. And if there's any sense I will make of it, it's that Jack Nicklaus had the Golden Bear. You had Greg Norman, who has the Shark. And then you've got Tiger Woods, who's got this tiger that's going to be going on some of the hoodies, the hats, the gloves, and anything else that can be sported around the greens and perhaps off green as well here. I think it's a bigger deal for TaylorMade as well, uh, making sure that in a segment where they didn't really have any major play in terms of athletic apparel or, or any clothing, this allows them an immediate way into the closets of a lot of potential golfers out there. It's true, and even if you look at the, the timing of this, when you saw some of these registered trademarks for Sunday Red, that was back in June of 2023 in Jamaica, yeah. so you knew something was coming. A lot of speculation, especially when you looked on, on X, like, you know, what is this big announcement? I had the close-up of his eye. I was like, is this some sort of, you know, Apple Vision Pro mashup? Yeah. Doing, doing the most for no good reason. But <laughs> the man now gets to have his own brand, sort of, you know, gets to control his own fate versus, you know, just being under Nike. He gets to really, you know, push it in the direction that he likes. Yeah, I mean, when you're GOAT, you can do the most, honestly, at the end of the day. You're taking a look at Nike shares right now. They're down by about two and a quarter percent. Broader market is slipping here on the day. So uh, one of the huge things, I think, going forward is the moisture wicking of how well, uh, you know, this performs on course. And then just additionally, we'll see what the sales look like for TaylorMade. We've been able to have the CEO on uh, from time to time in the past. So maybe we'll get another conversation on the books here. Uh, but of course, the timing of this launch, May 1st, uh, mm -hmm. most notably, is really prominently visualized on the website for Sunday Red, so we'll see what the fandom is that flocks into this apparel line. And it's around the same time that you're gonna have a lot of the major tournaments taking place as well. It'll be just after the Masters that takes place in April. Good timing. Yeah. Also, let's take a quick check of the markets here as we're rounding out this hour. You've got a look at the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. Okay, so we're off of some of the session lows, but still not looking great after today's hotter than expected CPI print. Indeed. And of course, Akiko Fujita will have you for the next hour. That does it for Brad and myself. Thank you for watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akika Fujita, and here's what I'm watching this hour. Consumer prices rising more than expected for the month of January. This comes as the Fed eyes its 2% inflation target. We're going to discuss what the new data means for the Fed's rate cutting cycle. Headset on, spatial computing, the tech behind the metaverse, getting a second look thanks to Apple's Vision Pro. Could this make the metaverse investable again? We'll discuss ahead. And so far, shares seeing a tough start to 2024, despite the return of student loan repayments. The company calling 2024 the year of transition. SoFi CEO Anthony Noto is going to be joining us to discuss that transition and a new partnership that's coming up later this hour. First, though, let's do a check of the markets. 90 minutes into the trading day, we are seeing a big sell off here on Wall Street on the back of that hotter than expected CPI print. Take a look at where the Dow is trading right now, down 1.2%, the S&P 500 down 1.2%, and the NASDAQ uh, seeing the biggest losses so far in this session down. 1.3%. This is a broad-based sell-off right now, but we are seeing utilities as well as uh, materials and uh, some other sectors here seeing the biggest hit consumer discretionary also down on the day. Of course, the hotter than expected CPI print leading, leading to big moves in bond yield here. The shorter end, we've seen significant moves there. The five-year yield up 14 basis points there at 4.26% and the 30-year yield on the longer end at 445 well, U.S. consumer prices rising more than expected in January. Investors still digesting the inflation print for clues on when the Federal Reserve will begin cutting interest rates. For more on where those expect expectations are likely to move, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jen Schomburger. Jen. Good morning, Akiko. For those hoping for a sign to declare victory on inflation for the Fed to begin cutting rates, well, they didn't get that this morning. The core consumer price index, which excludes volatile food and energy prices, clocked in at 3.9% in January, holding the same level as December. That's still roughly double the Fed's 2% inflation target. While the new reading showed inflation hasn't moved higher, it didn't improve either, and key components the Fed examines, services excluding shelter, remained sticky. Investors have pushed back bets on the timing for when the Fed could begin cutting rates to June now from May on the back of this hot data. That data point vindicating a chorus of Fed officials last week who urged caution on just how quickly the Fed could begin cutting rates, emphasizing they would need to see more evidence that inflation is moving back to their target on a sustainable basis. Indeed, Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin said it would be smart for the central bank to, quote, take our time, saying no one wants to see inflation reemerge. Meanwhile, Boston Fed President Susan Collins and Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester see rate cuts later this year. As Mester has warned, it would be a mistake to cut too soon. Perhaps Fed Chair Powell put it best at his press conference last month when he said, we have seen a good six months of data, but we need to see more data to feel fully confident. Some have conjectured that the Fed needs to see another six months of good data, and that ironically would put the Fed in the month of June, which is where investors are now pricing in the first rate cut. Of course, the data will tell. Akiko. And we'll keep turning to you for that, Jen. Jen Schaubberger with the very latest there, breaking down the data for us today. Thanks so much. Well, to dig in deeper to the latest consumer inflation data and what this means for the Fed, we've got Stephen Juno, Bank of America Securities, U.S. economist, joining us now. Uh, Stephen, good to talk to you. You heard Jen kind of breaking down some of these expectations there, potentially with the hotter than expected print today, moving the rate cut maybe to June. What's your read on the data today? And what's the one thing that stood out to you? Yeah, I mean, so we actually shifted our Fed call to from March to June after the January meeting. I think, you know, what we heard from the, the chair in the January meeting is that the Fed's not ready yet. They want to see greater confidence. Today's report, I think if there's one takeaway, is that it wasn't good enough for the Fed. It wasn't the confidence they wanted to see. When you look at the details of the report where they want to see confidence is really on the services side of inflation. Services, inflation, core services actually accelerated to about 0.7% month over month. Core goods deflation persisted. It was all used car price story. So really the components of inflation are not what the Fed wants to see, but they do have a lot more data 
uh, that they're going to get before the June meeting. This is just one of five reports that they'll get before June. So there's still time for that. Yeah, and, and to Jen's point, I mean, the Fed doesn't just look at, go, look at one data set, but you look at where the market reaction is today. Um, uh, certainly, it, it feels like there's been a lot of jitters around trying to sort out the timing of when that rate cutting cycle will begin. Um, even though this came in higher than expected, uh, does this change anything for you on where you think that timing of that cut is? I don't think so on the timing, because uh, June is probably enough time for them to get the data on hand. It, inflation and the path towards 2% was never always going to be a, a smooth ride. We saw very good progress last year, but that wasn't necessarily guaranteed to continue. It wasn't what we were forecasting. We thought this year would be more about sticky services inflation. That's what we're seeing. And we thought it would be about core goods deflation diminishing over time because we saw a lot of the supply side factors, um, the supply chains unclogging last year, really fade uh, last year, really impact the data last year. And that's not necessarily going to affect the data as much this year, because they're just not as strong of effects. So on that, I don't think it really affects the timing yet. If we see that this is a new trend in terms of this acceleration isn't just a one-off in January, we start to run at 0 0.4, 0 0.3% on a sustainable basis on core, core CPI inflation over the next few prints, then it could affect the timing of the Fed's cutting cycle. And that would also be in conjunction with the fact that activity, which started off the year, appears to be very resilient, very robust. So we're not really seeing signs that growth is slowing down. We obviously added a ton of jobs in January. Retail sales will get later this week, so that can influence the Fed's thought process because it's not just inflation that matters, it's also activity when they're thinking about uh, where they want or how they wanna set policy and when they wanna start that cutting cycle. Stephen, you mentioned services inflation, 5.4% increase year on year. If you compare it to the previous month, it's still up 0.7%. Why has that pr proven to be so sticky? So a big reason is actually shelter. Uh, shelter inflation you saw accelerate as well. That's a big driver behind that. When you look at core CPI, when you look at core services, it's really driven by shelter. And one thing to note there is that shelter inflation kind of lags uh, asking rent inflation. So what's actually happening today, if you're looking to get a new apartment, looking to take on a rent, what we've seen in terms of actual rent inflation is that in terms of asking rent inflation is that there has been a moderation and that should ultimately feed through to shelter inflation but it hasn't yet and that's something that you know we and the fed are expecting to see uh over the course of this year so we'll see what happens obviously it hasn't happened yet but we'll we'll see how shelter inflation really evolves any one risk here that you think Maybe investors are overlooking. I mean, you look across where we saw some of these gains. It, it does still feel like we're moving in the right direction, maybe not at the rate that the Fed would like. What are you going to be watching in the next several weeks between now and that March meeting? So I think what we'll be watching is the activity data. So we'll get retail sales. We'll be paying close attention to the PCE data, the PCE inflation data, which really is what the Fed targets, not CPI data. And PCE inflation is running a lot closer to the Fed's 2% target. We think the read through this month will also show a bit more of an acceleration in PCE inflation. Um, but that's something that we'll be watching closely. And obviously, it's the activity data, it's the jobs report was the January acceleration in uh, job growth, is that sticky, is that persistent? If it is, then you obviously have greater upside risk to growth, greater fears of demand-driven inflation if you're a member of the Fed when you're trying to think about how things will evolve. And that's what we'll be watching closely. It's just those big reports, uh, employment, CPI, uh, retail sales. Those are kind of the things we'll be watching to see how not just inflation is progressing, but also how activity is progressing. Stephen Juno, Bank of America Securities, U.S. economist. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. And let's do a quick check of the markets as we continue to track this sell-off coming on the back of that hotter-than-expected inflation print. The Dow coming off of session lows, but still down more than 440 points here. The S&P 500 down 54 and the Nasdaq down 175. Well, coming up, could Apple's Vision Pro make the metaverse cool again? An expert weighs in on the future of spatial computing. That's on the other side.
Well, Elon Musk is taking on the state of Delaware, the CEO moving the corporate home of his brain implant company Neuralink from Delaware to Nevada. This after another proposal to move Tesla's incorporation to Texas. The move comes after a Delaware judge struck down Musk's compensation or $55.8 billion CEO pay package. How likely is a move for Tesla's incorporation from Delaware to Texas? Let's bring in Yahoo Finance legal reporter Alexis Keenan. And Alexis, of course, it's not just Tesla. I mean, so many companies have been incorporated in Delaware for many, many years because of the more business-friendly environment. Yeah, many, many, many years, Akiko. And in fact, it was New Jersey that used to be the top spot for business incorporations, but it was dethroned back in 1913 uh, to Delaware's dominance, which has proceeded ever since. So a lot of questions have been swirling about whether Delaware could lose that dominant position as a place to incorporate, particularly for public companies, and also whether Tesla moving to Texas will really become a real thing. That's ever since Musk had questioned that invalidation by a Delaware judge in Chancery Court of that $56 billion pay package that he earned in that uh, performance-based compensation for the company. Now, to talk about those questions, I've been asking a lot of questions of corporate legal experts, and what they say is that they don't see Delaware being dethroned anytime in the near future, though a move for Tesla could become a real thing. But look, it's up to the shareholders if they want to do that. Tesla would have to call if they want to do this before its annual meeting that takes usually late place later in the summer. They would would have to ask for a special meeting. They'd have to inform shareholders, let them know uh, when they would want to do this, and particularly why they would want to do a move to Texas, and that'll become important. Now, you mentioned there some of the reasons that Delaware has been so popular. One, it's easy to file for incorporation in the state. Also, it's business-friendly corporate laws, super important. Uh, Texas, for its part, it tends to follow Delaware's law, so Musk might not get that much of a different result in Texas if the same case were to go before judges there. Also, though, the business-friendly court in Delaware, that is of uber importance, and that could be really important to Tesla shareholders because shareholders, they like the predictability that Delaware has, these this, this uh, over a century's worth of court cases, so they kind of know what they're getting there. So that could be a significant hurdle uh, for shareholders to vote yes to go to Texas. Uh, also, uh, ultimately, it's going to be up to their vote. Now, if shareholders also, if they think that it's not in the best interest of the company, and if they think the move is for a reason other than for the benefit of the company, they could also challenge going to Texas even after a shareholder vote has happened. So there's a lot of hurdles that really have to take place. Uh, but whether or not it will happen, we don't know yet. We have not seen the company move for this move to Texas, though Elon Musk did post to Twitter in his criticism of this court decision that he would be doing this immediately. Akiko? Well, you can imagine so many other states watching this closely, looking to really go in and recruit some of these companies. What are some other states that companies are could potentially move to if they're not in Delaware. Yeah, so, okay, so we covered Texas a little bit there. It follows Delaware laws. Texas, though, has made some inroads to establish a business court, much like what Delaware has. Now, of course, that would take some time. And uh, there might be some concerns about home court advantage for businesses that are incorporated there, that are headquartered there, um, as Tesla is. It has its physical headquarters there. Um, but they are working to establish a court, and maybe someday, someday, they might be able to have that kind of influence that the Delaware courts have. You also have Georgia, Wyoming, and Utah also setting up these types of business courts, though not gaining too much traction as of yet. Then you have New Jersey, New York, Illinois, and North Carolina. Those are states where there are special dockets in court for business decisions. But once again, they have not gained the kind of popularity that Delaware has. And one real special outlier is Nevada. 
Senate. Now, Nevada did something uh, very strikingly different about a decade ago. The, the state passed uh, in its legislature new laws that really relaxes the liability for directors and officers and executives of public corporations. They can choose to waive fiduciary duties, all three of the fiduciary duties for directors. So uh, that's one place where companies have been seeking out. And there's actually a case right now that's pending in Delaware Chancery Court where the controlling shareholder of Trip Advisor and its parent company has a litigation uh, where shareholders challenged, challenged a move uh, of that company from Delaware to Nevada. So we'll be keeping an eye on the result of that case. A lot of potential moving pieces there. Alexis Keenan, as always, thanks so much. Yep. Well, before generative AI, companies were obsessed with the metaverse. Remember that? So much so that the company formerly known as Facebook changed its name to Meta. Well, we're now nearly two weeks after Apple's Vision Pro's official launch. Spatial computing, which is the technology behind the metaverse, is getting a lot of renewed attention here. Joining me now on the future of spatial computing is Kathy Hackel, Spatial Dynamics Co-CEO. And Kathy, you have been a metaverse evangelist, if you will, uh, talking about this for some time. But I imagine you've had a chance to, to play with the Vision Pro um, a few weeks now. Why don't you first give me your response or just your take on the latest headset and how it maybe differs from for example, those like Meta's that have been on the market for some time. Yeah, it's it's a really advanced um, piece of consumer technology. Uh, I'm an Apple Vision Pro developer, so I was actually able to use the device before many people did. Um, but it is truly advanced in the capabilities of what it can do. Um, it, it really does expand technology in new ways. And I know we're going to talk about spatial computing, but it's very different than other hardware that consumers have seen. Um, because it's not virtual reality in, in, in 100%, right? It's more about putting computing and virtual experiences in someone's physical world. So the device itself is pretty advanced. It is pretty expensive, of course. That's not, uh, you know, $3,500 is not something that every consumer is going to purchase. Um, but it is very advanced technology. Um, one of the things that I love about the device is that it actually uses... Uh, your eyes as the mouse and your fingers as the clicker, which is a totally different way of engaging, um, but very different device, much more advanced. Uh, there's definitely $3,500 worth of technology in the device, but maybe not $3,500 worth of value for the mass consumer just yet. Uh, so it is a version one. It's an it's the early days, to be honest. Um, Kathy, you know, you mentioned that this isn't just VR, it is mixed reality where you can act, it's AR incorporated as well, so you can actually see what's around you. I mean, that would seem to be a big leap in the positive direction. So you're not sort of just confined to this headset as well, but there is a question about the content following. So how does this move forward beyond the Apple fan base to wider adoption? Yeah, it's going to take a while, but what you're going to start to see is a lot of companies start to bring in new hardware devices. And this is as much a play on hardware as it is a play on software and especially AI. I try to remind everyone, especially when they try the device, that there are about 12 cameras and this device is using really advanced computer vision. Um, so there's a, a huge, a huge part here. Um, I think content, um, there's not that many apps just yet that truly take full advantage of the device. So I think we'll see a progression into more companies doing more innovative things on the device. Where I think it gets interesting is when you start to think about an iPhone 16 or an iPhone 17 having more spatial capabilities. I think that that's where we get to that point where potentially more consumers and more people are going to be interested in spatial computing. How long, Kathy, until we move beyond this headset? I mean, it is still very heavy. It's still very bulky. What's that going to look like in the future? It's still five to 10 years, I think, from a, a device that replaces our computers and mobile phones. It'll start slowly, right? We're still, the idea that we're not going to have our mobile phones next year is silly, right? Uh, we're not going to all be wearing Apple Vision Pros outside, <laughs> unlike, some, unlike some people that want to do that. Um, it will take some time, right? I think that the, the important thing here is to understand that we went from desktop, desktop computing where computers were on our desks at home and at work into mobile computing where our devices were on our hands, you know, or, or devices that we could take on the go into devices that are going to bring that virtual experience 
into the physical world. So these spatial computers, this new type of hardware, this new type of computing that's coming, it's about bringing that data layer in front of us where it's visible. And that's what's going to start to change and evolve. So in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see a huge evolution. I would say in the next 18 to 12, 18 to 24 months, you'll see more hardware plays from a lot of these companies, um, You know, whether it's an open AI working with Johnny Ive to launch something, uh, or whether it's Meta introducing new devices, which they, they said they're going to do. Uh, it's going to evolve quite fast. Okay, we'll be watching it all develop. It's been interesting to see uh, so many of those headsets out in the wild and how users are incorporating it so far. Kathy Hackle, as always, thanks so much. Thank you. We are continuing to watch a broad-based sell-off on Wall Street. Let's take a look at where all three majors are as we count down to that noon hour here. Uh, the Dow down 408 points, the S&P 500, and the Nasdaq down more than 1% right now. Of course, Treasury yields in focus today on the back of that hotter-than-expected CPI print. Uh, a move higher across the yield curve here, the 10-year now at roughly 427, and the 30-year yield at 444, roughly. Well, coming up, SoFi Shares having a rough start to 2024. We're going to speak with the company's CEO, Anthony Noto, who's going to be joining us on the other side of the break. We'll be right back. Well, more layoffs coming this morning. Paramount announcing it will be cutting 800 jobs, amounting to about 3% of its global workforce. Our very own Ali Canal uh, following these details. And of course, Ali, this comes uh, amid a lot of uncertainty for the studio uh, with a potential sale 
um, of its assets. Yeah, the layoffs announcement coming as M&A rumors are really swirling for this company. We've heard reported bids from Byron Allen, uh, Skydance, uh, among even our parent company, Apollo Global. So this is something that's heavily in the background as this company continues to lose money, especially within its streaming division. Paramount saying the job cuts are going to take place today, Tuesday, and will impact about 800 employees, translating to roughly 3% of that total workforce. There was an internal memo from CEO Bob Backish. He reiterated previous rhetoric that layoffs are necessary in order to return the company to earnings growth and right size costs. He said, quote, I'm confident this is the right decision for our company and that these adjustments will enable us to build on our momentum and at and execute on our strategic vision for the years ahead. Now, shares right now, they're down about 4%. They have fallen about 13% since the start of the year. And again, like I was saying, this comes as the company has really struggled with profitability. We saw streaming losses of $238 million in the third quarter. And although losses have narrowed, that's not something investors want to see. We are going to get an update from Paramount at the end of the month when it comes to fourth quarter and full year 2023 earnings results. So that'll be something that investors will closely be watching for, especially on the heels of this layoff announcement. Uh, Ali, there is some positive news for Paramount today. CBS announcing record viewership for the Super Bowl. How much of this can we attribute it to the Swift bump? I think you can't help but give a nod to Taylor Swift. Yeah, Finance's Brian Sazi did get a chance to speak with Paramount CEO Bob Backish prior to this. And he even spoke about the Taylor Swift effect. I'm sure if you're a Chiefs fan, if you are one of the broadcast distributors, you are certainly happy to have Taylor Swift in your corner. More than 123 million viewers across the company's platform. This was led by CBS. And it makes it the most watched telecast in history. And I think it's safe to say whatever Taylor Swift touches seems to turn to gold. A lot of historical nods, I think, are associated with the pop star. So we'll see if we can continue to build on this momentum as we head uh, into NFL season next year. It's going to certainly be interesting because the NFL has become a very fragmented place when you think about viewership. We just got word that Amazon Prime is going to hold an exclusive NFL playoff game. We saw Peacock hold one this year. We also have Thursday Night Football on Amazon Prime, along with the different broadcast channels. Um, and then, of course, with Sunday Ticket, that is owned by Google's YouTube. So there's just a lot of places for the consumer that they have to go to if they want to watch an NFL game. But clearly, uh, CBS leading the way here, 120 million viewers on that. Again, across all the platforms, 123.4 million tuning in. Yeah, incredible numbers. Yes. Maybe it helped that also went into OT, right? Of Exciting course. game at the very end there. Ali Canals, always, thanks so much. Well, SoFi shares have seen a difficult start to 2024, down more than 15 percent despite the return of student loan repayments. The company posted a quarterly profit in its most recent quarter. CEO Anthony Noto has called this the year of the transition as the company shifts its focus from lending to financial services and its tech platforms. Let's bring in Anthony Noto himself, SoFi CEO, alongside our very own executive editor, Brian Sazi. And Anthony, it's always good to have you on the show. Um, I'd love to start on the big picture here on the macro economy. Economy, given the data that we got out this morning, inflation coming in a little hotter than expected. Um, on your recent earnings call, you gave a pretty conservative outlook about four rate cuts for the Fed is what you're expecting. Talk to me about what you're seeing in the fundamentals that points to the resilience in the economy, more importantly, the consumer, even as we expect a, a slower easing cycle coming through. Well, first, thank you for having me on. And I'm really looking forward to talking about the new partnership we have as the official bank of the National Basketball Association. It's another step forward, building on the momentum that we've had in the last six years. We just finished, as you mentioned, 2023 with record revenue, um, our first quarter of gap profitability exceeding 7.5 million members. And it's a real testament to the fact that 
we continue to march towards our long-term goal of being a top 10 financial institution. Um, and we've hit those record results and we're taking to the next level now with this partnership uh, with the NBA, which I'd like to talk about. But let me first address your question. Um, our outlook for 2024 is a conservative outlook. It's an outlook that I think is below what consensus would be for the macroeconomic environment. Specifically, we talked about only four rate cuts instead of six. My view is if there's six rate cuts, it's because we're in a recession. We talked about unemployment going over 5% and we talked about GDP contraction. Uh, nothing's changed in our view as it relates to the macro. As it relates to our company, we gave an outlook that shows really strong growth in the com combined segments of our financial services business and our technology platform business uh, that was about 50%. Um, we are slowing down uh, the lending business uh, given our outlook for the economy and the macroeconomic environment. We have more demand than we'll actually satisfy because we wanna take a more conservative view. And we'll end 2024 with 50% of our revenue being from our technology platform and financial services segment and 50% from lending, which is a dramatically different mix than it was six years ago, where it was over 95% lending. So um, we're reading the tea leaves, looking at the economy, looking at the outlook for interest rates and inflation, uh, and making the right prudent decisions on how we're allocating capital to maximize shareholder returns. We also gave an outlook for the next three years that give investors a longer term view about where we could be um, over the next three years. And we're really excited about uh, that profile of growth and earnings potential. Anthony, uh, Brian here, good, good to see you. Within that new partnership you, you referenced, one thing caught my attention, the creation of the SoFi Generational Wealth Fund. And my read on it was despite uh, markets really at record highs, there are still a lot of average investors out there that are not getting access to the information they need. Do, do you think investors are still making a lot of mistakes? Um, I think that SoFi is unique in that we're trying to build a lifetime relationship with people and serve all of their financial needs across borrowing, lending, spending, investing, and protecting. Um, and as it relates to our SoFi Invest business, we're trying to give broad-based selection so they can invest better and invest sooner. So we provide ETFs, SoFi robo-advisory accounts. We also provide single stocks without commissions. We had several IPOs that we offered to the Main Street investor at IPO prices. And we recently launched alternative asset uh, investment opportunities, things the Main Street investor never gets access to uh, because of the amount of money that they have. They don't get treated the same way as those people with high net wealth. This partnership with the NBA hits on two things. First and foremost, we want to be a top 10 financial institution in the United States. We want to be a most admired brand. In order for us to get there, we have to build great products, which we've already proven we've done. We have to create a unique value proposition, which we've already proven we've been done. But now we have to build awareness and credibility. And so this partnership with the NBA, like SoFi Stadium with the NFL, allows us to reach 200 million NBA fans that are passionate about that sport. Being a partner with the NBA brings us credibility, but it also brings us awareness. The second piece of this I'm really proud of, and it's partnering with Jason Tatum on the SoFi Generational Wealth Fund, which is specifically SoFi and the Jason Tatum Foundation putting dollars into the local market in St. Louis to help with financial literacy, financial education, and home ownership. And that's something that's critically important in helping people get their money right and something I'm really proud of and parting with Jason. We both benefited from two very strong, brave women as moms that have helped us navigate through the financial challenges. But I think we both would have benefited significantly from a company like SoFi when we were younger. Uh, Anthony, since we are on the topic um, of sports here, you're obviously talking about your partnership today with the NBA, but you've obviously got a huge presence in the NFL as well. I, I wonder if you can put your hat on as former, former NFL CEO to talk about what the sports landscape is like right now. We're coming off of a week where we saw some big announcements coming through on sports streaming specifically with the bundle with Disney as well as Fox and Warner Discovery. Um, it feels like we're looking at a really fragmented landscape. And I wonder from the league perspective, what you think the viewing experience is likely to be like? I actually think it's a golden age for professional sports, college sports, and live sports generally. It's a golden age for them because for the first time, they're occupying over 90% of the most popular shows with the largest unduplicated audiences. The fact that the National Football League during primetime Thursday night, Sunday night, Monday night, is still aggregating over 20 million unduplicated viewers in one sitting is incredibly unique. You'd have to go back to 2005, 2006, when a broadcast show had that size audience on Thursday night going into the weekend where 
big auto manufacturers and alcohol producers would want to advertise in front of those weekends. Those audiences cannot be reached through linear television. Similarly, they cannot be reached through streaming. And the sports content is going to be the fuel that drives the growth of streaming, just like it was the fuel that drove the growth of the technology for video, um, broad, broadband video as well. Um, what we saw is the evolution of different platforms. You have the cable platform that was pay television after we had free broadcast television. Sports helped drive the adoption of pay cable television. And then it helped drive the adoption of satellite television. And then it's helped drive the adoption of mobile. And now we're in a period where it's going to drive streaming activity. And you see the emergence of these huge platforms with large audiences starting to pay for live sports for the first time, whether it's Apple or Netflix or Amazon or YouTube. Um, they recognize the value of that content, and it's only going to increase in value given its large unduplicated audiences. It'll take a transition. It'll take a transition for the companies to figure out how can they economically afford to pay these prices in the streaming model, which is very different than the pay cable bundle. Anthony, uh, lastly, what does it mean for, for companies like you that want to have a presence in all things sports? What does it do to the value of those deals, and, and how is it? how can it be easily afforded? Those value, the value of those deals only go up. When we did the NFL stadium rights deal with Stan Kroenke and the Los Angeles uh, Rams, as well as the Chargers, we looked at primetime television. Most people don't understand. We did that deal for television, for reaching large, unduplicated audiences. I had a thesis that we would get four to six primetime games at SoFi Stadium. And at 20 to 25 million unique viewers times four to six, we would get a larger reach and an ability to hit an audience at a lower cost than we were paying for television. And what we do when games are at SoFi Stadium on a Monday night is we run ads during the game. So they're not only are they aware of the brand, but they actually understand what the brand stands for. And guess what we do the next Monday night? We run the ads again because the same audience comes back the next week, even though the teams are different. And so it's easier to reach people 10 to 15 times in a season by partnering with the NFL. The NBA, same story. They have even higher frequency with multiple nights of primetime television throughout the year. And so our partnership with the NBA is about being there with them, a credible brand, about reaching their large unduplicated audience. They have 200 million fans uh, behind the NBA, and it's another way for us to continue to reach audiences that we need to penetrate and that we need to build trust and reliability with as a household brand name. Anthony Noto, SoFi CEO, um, always good to have you on the show alongside our executive editor, Brian Sazi. Thanks so much for your time today. Great. Thank you for having me. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Well, after, after a strong start to the year for markets, uh, today's CPI print shaking some investor confidence, sending major indices lower. We are seeing a broad-based sell-off right now with the Dow now down more than 400 points. For more on what the report says about the state of the economy, let's bring in Daniel Hornung, National Economic Council Deputy Director. Um, Daniel, good to talk to you today. Uh, give me the White House read on what this says about where we are in this fight against inflation. Well, it's good to be with you. Um, you know, I think that the monthly core number did come in above expectations. But if you take a step back, I don't think it fundamentally changes anything about where we've been over the last seven months or so in terms of the trajectory of the economy, which is a trajectory towards uh, sustained lower inflation uh, while job growth and employment and the economy overall remain strong. I think one thing in particular that we pull out of the report from this morning is we now see real wages over the course of this business cycle have grown faster than any business cycle in more than 50 years. So, you know, I think overall uh, our, our perspective is uh, we continue on the efforts to lower costs for American workers and American families and continued strong progress in the economy. I mean, you point to the economic data that we've gotten recently. The trajectory is headed in the right direction. Inflation starting to come down. You look at where the jobs market recently was, a huge, huge, strong number. How does the White House go and sell that story to voters right now? Because if you look at polls, the president just doesn't pull well when voters are asked about who can handle the economy better, whether it's President Trump or former President Trump and President Biden. Well, there's no question it's been a difficult few years uh, for the American worker, for the American consumer with the pandemic, with Russia's war in Ukraine leading to real challenges in our energy markets and global supply chains. Uh, but one of the things we're seeing in recent months in particular is a real uptick in measures like consumer sentiment and consumer confidence. And I think a central reason for that is where I started, that uh, folks' wages are now growing faster than prices. We see wealth higher than it was before the pandemic after accounting for inflation, uh, wages higher uh, after accounting for inflation. So I think you know, it will be important in the months ahead uh, for us to continue to tell the story about what the president's economic agenda has meant for workers, has meant for families, and also to be very clear uh, that, uh, about the choice that the American people uh, face right now and the contrast in Washington, D.C., a president who's primarily focused on working to lower costs for American families, and unfortunately, Republicans in Congress who've been more focused on tax cuts for the wealthy and large corporations. Why do you think the president isn't getting credit for the turnaround that you're talking about right now? I mean, to your point, consumer sentiment has moved, improved. The overall feeling within the economy has improved. But voters aren't necessarily tying that directly to the president's policies right now, if you look at polling. Well, when you ask folks uh, not only what they think about their own financial situation, what they think about the direction of the economy, as you know, that's improving. When you ask folks about uh, what they think about the president's policies that he's signed into law to lower costs, things like lowering prescription drug costs and health care premiums and clean energy costs, those are overwhelmingly popular. When you ask people about the president's plans to raise taxes on the largest corporations and the wealthiest Americans in order to reduce our deficit, that's very popular. Uh, so, you know, I think a key focus uh, from here will be continuing to go out in the country and tell to the American people the story of what the president has done uh, to really uh, lead us to a strong economic recovery that works for workers and families, and also how his plans uh, would continue to grow our economy and really create a fairer economy going forward. Daniel Hornung, National Economic Council Deputy Director, uh, joining us uh, today from D.C. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, coming up, dating app dilemmas. We're going to speak to the CEO of Coffee Meets Bagel about how much the company is doing to grab a bigger share of the market in an increasingly competitive space. This, of course, on the eve of Valentine's Day. That conversation is coming up on the other side.
Well, nearly 45% of people have reportedly found prospective partners from online dating apps, according to a recent Forbes survey. And statistics reports the number of dating app users is expected to grow nearly 9% in the next four years alone. Our next guest hoping to get a big share of that market. For more on the business of love, let's bring in Coffee Meets Bagel CEO, Dawoon Kang. Uh, Dawoon, it's good to talk to you today. I imagine you get a lot of attention around Valentine's Day. But talk to me about sort of the, the, the state of online dating right now as you see it through the app. You know, you've got a few years here coming out of the pandemic now. How have you seen changes in terms of how people interact? You know, pandemic was an interesting time, of course. When it started, everybody just stopped dating, right? Because, you know, there is a, now the additional health consideration that you have to think about. However, I think overall, as uh, pandemic elongated, it really highlighted, highlighted the importance of connection. Uh, we've been serving our users throughout COVID and um, subsequently afterwards. And um, we've been seeing a lot of people expressing that they really want to value long-term relationship, genuine connection, honesty, kindness, committed relationships. So I think overall, it really um, fundamentally shifted how people view relationship. Um, this is an increasingly crowded space. Uh, there's, of course, your company, Coffee Meets Bagel. There's the original Match. There's Hinge. There's Tinder. Uh, there's Bumble. How do you set yourself apart in that space yeah. right now? Yeah, exactly. Um, Coffee Meets Bagel has always been focused on servicing not every single out there, but singles who are looking for something more serious, aka long-term relationships. So, you know, if you look at dating apps out there, like some of the uh, apps that you mentioned, fundamentally how the dev app operates is very similar. You We give them opportunity to um, meet people, then you connect, you chat, and hopefully go on a date, right? And so including Coffee Meets Bagel, the operating mechanism is pretty similar. I would say what really distinguishes Coffee Meets Bagel apart from other dating apps is our community of our daters because we've always been so focused and you know been sharing the fact that you come to Coffee Meets Bagel if you're looking for something more serious, not casual date. We've been able to cultivate that community. So over 90% of our daters on CMB says that they're looking for something more serious. So what's great about that is if that's you, if you're looking for something serious, you wouldn't be wasting time connecting with somebody who's not looking for the same thing. So I would say that is the biggest value proposition for Coffee Meets Bagel, and we will always continue to focus on serving that segment of daters the best. The question is always how you translate that into revenue and profits. And I wonder when you look at the behavior of your users, how many are willing to actually invest in dating, as in willing to pay the extra, willing to pay premium to find a better match? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, most of the daters who join Coffee Meets Bagel, they're using the pre version of the app, right? So um, you can you can join Coffee Meets Bagel and you don't have to pay a, you know, a dime if you don't want to and still enjoy a lot of um, free features. However, I think because Coffee Meets Bagel is so particularly focused on um, long-term relationship, there are quite a you know sizable number of users who are willing to open up their wallet and subscribe to premium because um, the benefits that we offer and the number of connections that you're able to get in the same amount of time that you invest um, a subscriber versus non-subscriber is pretty significant. About 60% more connections are generated for subscribers in the same period versus non-subscribers. So um, I would say it's, it's a pretty sizable number who are willing to invest and um, open up their wallet. Dawoon King, Coffee Meets Bagel CEO. Um, it'll be interesting to see the big bump, or if you get a big bump on the back of Valentine's Day here. Appreciate you joining us today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Well, the latest IRS data has shown that the average tax refund from last year was roughly $3,200, a number that has been going up year over year. Experts are pointing out that increasing refunds may not be a great thing for Americans. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Rebecca Chen to give us the details. Rebecca, explain to us. Hi, Akiko. Yes, so everybody loves a big tax refund and it almost feels like a reward for doing your taxes and sometimes it even feels like a, a little extra paycheck when you do your taxes. But experts are saying that we have to change our mentality about how tax refunds are because we have to remind ourselves that it is our money to begin with. 
And when you have too much withholding with the government, it is essentially like giving them an interest-free loan throughout the year. The nature of tax refund is that it's really an overpayment that we made during the year. So the government is giving them back. And this is quite a big deal because we're living in a very high interest, high debt environment. And if you are one of the people who have who are seeing your credit card um, balances go up, for example, the average household now seeing seven thousand um, dollars of credit card balance, and they are paying about twenty one percent of APR on their car. So, if you're really seeing some of the high consuming um, debt on your end, it really doesn't make sense for you to over withhold with the government while paying such high interest. You can really um, throughout the year lower your withholding and use that money to pay off your high interest rate credit card debts, and you'll be better off financially. So what should taxpayers be doing in this situation then? I mean, as they look at maybe not this year, but the next year, so that refund isn't so high at the end of the year. I think the first thing to really focus on is take a look. Uh, if you're somebody who consistently gets high tax refunds year after year, really think about if you're withholding too much. That, that is the first step and recognizing that that may not be such a good thing. And the second thing is to think is to really reconsider about how much you're holding. Most people don't know that you can change your withholding throughout the year. It's a fairly simple process. All you have to do is reach out to your HR Ask for the W withholding form, change the number that you want to put in, and it should be reflected within your next paycheck. So it's a quick and simple process for taxpayers to know. Um, so, but at the end of the day, or at the end of the day, just remember that this money is yours and you want to put it where it will be the best and best bang for your buck. And that could be in a high savings yield account and or that can be paying off the debt, but that is definitely not with the IRS. Okay, some good tax tips there. Rebecca Chen, as always, thanks so much. Let's do a final check of the markets before we let you go as we count down to the noon hour. The Dow having its worst day of 2024, now down 445 points roughly. This coming on the back of that hotter than expected inflation print. We are seeing the S&P 500 down about 1.1% here. And the NASDAQ, the biggest laggard on the day, down about 1.4%. Certainly still more to come here uh, on the day with some big earnings on tap after the bell. Airbnb, a big one reporting there. And of course, we will be all across that here on Yahoo Finance. That does it for me in this hour. Much more to come. Keep it right here.